Good morning. This is week two of information security, and this is Mike Wilkes. I am just getting the share set up, make sure I have it correct. Um, doo -doo -doo. That should be correct. And present. Pull up my notes. Make them a little bigger. And let's see, um, looks like uh, audio is good. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I don't turn on the headphones for this. All right, let's get started then. Uh, week two, information system security technique. Uh, jumpstart your familiarity with an introduction this week to some of the tools and techniques of information security and where the battle to protect users and data from bad actors takes place. It used to be the model for security to have a hard perimeter and to fight the battle in the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. But identity is the new perimeter, and identity management is at the forefront of maintaining control over data and access to data. To start off this week's lecture, I'm going to talk about people, process, and tools. First, let's review various InfoSec roles uh, that we find in organizations. One person might hold several of these roles in smaller organizations, but in sufficiently large companies, the roles are spread across a team of hundreds of InfoSec professionals. So we've got uh, analyst, uh, engineer, administrator, architect, director, chief information security officer, consultants and specialists, uh, leaders and engineers. Uh, leaders and engineers, so I'm gonna talk about in a second. Uh, so the analyst, this is someone who assesses vulnerabilities, recommends solutions, uh, and works on best practices uh, within various sort of domains within InfoSec. Engineers perform monitoring and forensic analysis. Uh, administrators, that role is someone that installs and manages particular security tools and systems, and I'll be going into each of these. Uh, an architect, uh, security architect, uh, this is uh, someone who designs systems or at least major components of, of security systems because uh, there's always implementation choices as to how and where, whether something's deployed on-prem or a SaaS uh, solution uh, or potentially a hybrid model. Uh, for director level, this is a management role. It may include hands-on work in smaller organizations, but typically you're starting to move away from uh, individual contributor titles now. Uh, Chief Information Security Officer, this management role is responsible for the entire organization. And uh, then consultants and specialists, they can perform any one of multiple specializations as an SME, which is a subject matter expert. Uh, so one of my definitions that I use uh, for leaders is people that see and act on and define the vision. And engineers, they're driven by the vision and they build tools and processes. Uh, a typical staffing ratio of 100 to 1 uh, is what I've seen uh, published for developers to InfoSec account. So if you have 400 developers committing code and building software, then you would have you know, four InfoSec headcount. That's a typical staffing ratio, although it is going down a bit with automation, uh, meaning it goes, uh, you could have um, you know, maybe uh, a 60 to one ratio uh, in some organizations. Um, let's see. Uh, QA ratio. Um, this one I come across um, as a five to one. So for every uh, developer, for every five developers, there would be one uh, QA headcount. And then um, operations tasks, uh, operations staff is typically staffed at a 10 to one ratio of 10 developers for every operational headcount. Uh, although again, it should be noted that uh, the practice of DevOps and automation and infrastructure as code uh, is definitely changing that number. Uh, and of course, allowing you to have more developers per operations headcount. But a 10 to one ratio was fairly consistent uh, for many years. And the other thing I would mention, uh, be both, be a leader and be an engineer. Uh, the best way to get promoted in the InfoSec career path is to be and act the job and the role that you want to have awarded. Typically that's uh, a management kind of philosophy um, uh, that you need to sort of own the responsibilities of the role before you actually get the title. So let's dive into some of these roles for a couple of minutes. In InfoSec roles, uh, you would have the analyst, 
Uh, think of a tier one analyst in a SOC, right? A security operations center. This is the 24 by seven eyes on glass type of resource. Uh, and these can be in-sourced or outsourced models. Um, I've previously been pretty successful with uh, outsourcing tier one SOC um, just because it's a tough, tough job to staff and maintain a 24 seven team. Uh, they need you know, time to sleep. They need to have a rotation. Uh, so you'd be looking at like, you know, six or seven people potentially to run your own SOC and hiring those people and retaining them uh, is not easy. It's a lot better in my mind to have economies of scale and let uh, a large, you know, managed security uh, service provider an MSSP uh, handle that for you. And then you, I typically hire just the tier three analysts or, you know, top level uh, infosec engineers um, to be escalated to from the uh, outsourced uh, SOC team. Uh, the tier two analysts, so an alert has been assessed and it requires further investigation. Um, classification and machine learning and dedupe um, has already occurred uh, for a tier two uh, SOC analyst before they're looking at an alert and deciding whether to escalate. And then of course, tier three, this is when you've escalated to an onshore team or to uh, an EDR um, or an MTR, right? Managed threat response uh, or EDR, um, what is it? Uh, um, endpoint detection and response uh, solution that you may have purchased. Uh, the InfoSec is, uh, analyst is responsible for assessing vulnerabilities, for recommending vendor solutions, identifying best practices. And as I mentioned, uh, we have EDR, MTR, and there's also something now uh, called SOAR, S-O-A-R, uh, Security Orchestration and Automated Response. Looking at the engineer role, um, again, this performs monitoring and forensic analysis, integrates tools and systems. The InfoSec engineer performs monitoring uh, and some uh, overlap uh, with the analyst role, but depending on the specialization or area of focus, they can be creating processes and integrating tools and systems. Uh, they could be authoring playbooks uh, for SOAR. Um, Splunk, um, this is a screenshot here of a, a Splunk uh, Phantom uh, tool. Splunk purchased Phantom uh, as their SOAR solution to augment what they were doing with their SIEM, uh, which was log, um, uh, you know, what uh, information and event management, right, log aggregation. Uh, community playbooks for antivirus automated detection. That's what's actually shown in this one, a community playbook uh, for Phantom from uh, Splunk Phantom, uh, where you can have, you know, an automated detection and response uh, to a ransom uh, where uh, detection event, where it would simply isolate the machine and it would then analyze maybe on virus total, send you know, it up for analysis and signatures, uh, or it could be triggered by you know, behavioral um, uh, triggers, not just um, antivirus signatures. Uh, the average IT InfoSec analyst or engineer, uh, when I looked up these numbers last year, the average salary was around 115,000. The InfoSec administrator uh, installs and manages one or more security tools and systems. So what you see here, I think, is what a screenshot I took of Qualys. Um, so let's say that you're responsible for vulnerability management within an organization. So you would have typically an administrator of uh, Qualys or another tool, um, you know, Nessus uh, from Tenable. Um, there could be people that are uh, administering a phishing testing platform, uh, somebody that's administering the SIEM, like I mentioned, the uh, log and analytics uh, and aggregation tool. Uh, you could have an administrator for a DLP solution uh, or for a particular antivirus, right? Carbon Black, CrowdStrike, um, all sorts of endpoint tools. Uh, another administrator role could be responsible for a secure email gateway or an SSL proxy, which is performing egress traffic uh, and interception of outbound SSL uh, traffic. Uh, another administrative responsibility could fall for someone to administer a DNS firewall uh, or next gen firewalls on the information security team. Um, another person or several of these roles could fall under one, one particular job. Uh, WAF, a web application firewall, sufficiently complicated uh, to keep in step uh, with what's happening on the code development for a site. Um, as I mentioned here, vulnerability management scanning, uh, secure file transfer, CASB, um, single sign-on, multi-factor auth. These are all different uh, roles an administrator might take on uh, within an organization or to have one or more of them under their responsibility. In terms of the InfoSec architect, uh, they're going to be designing systems and major components. Uh, this can be specialized in AppSec, uh, and you may be dealing, for example, with OWASP vulnerabilities or static code analysis tools to be um, you know, an enterprise cloud architect. You need to understand threat modeling and to perform architecture reviews for this uh, particular 
infosec architect or sec arc type roles. The average salary for an administrator or an architect, you know, maybe 125K. Uh, next up comes director. Sometimes this is the top of the infosec arc or org chart. Uh, many companies don't go above uh, a director of, of um, information security. Uh, when a CISO or a CIO doesn't exist, then these are usually, you know, going to be two or more of these director roles, separating out uh, information security and security operations. So think of information security as one that's implementing infrastructure and projects for the security team and for the security tools. And then security operations is much more incident response, you know, and driven event driven type um, responsibilities. Um, what else? Uh, yeah. Uh, operational versus project uh, focused work. The InfoSec director is usually a pure management role, but it could include a hands-on responsibilities in smaller organizations. And that is increasingly the case, the way I've looked at um, job position descriptions uh, in, in recent times. Uh, they are expecting less pure play managers. You may have heard it referred to as a player coach um, or you know, a pure coach uh, or an individual contributor would be a pure player type role. Uh, ownership often includes documentation of information security policy, as well as BCP DR planning and testing. Uh, InfoSec managers uh, have to partner with HR, with legal, with the engineering teams, with product, and with sales. The average salary here for an InfoSec director, uh, 200K. And now we get to the CISO or CSO role, Chief Security Officer or Chief Information Security Officer. So this is the person who builds the program, hires the staff, runs the program, is ultimately accountable for it all, reports on the key metrics, uh, speaks to regulators when necessary. Um, 18 to 24 months tenure, tenure uh, in the role. It's pretty short actually, uh, because a lot of times uh, CISOs are blamed you know, for a breach and whether or not it was the CISO's fault, they're ultimately accountable for the integrity of the platform. And uh, when it's been breached, it's usually the case that there will be a change of guard and they will take the CISO um, out and bring someone else in. Uh, the chief information security officer or chief security officer is going to be, you know, like I said, responsible for the entire organization. Oftentimes they will report to the CTO or the CIO, uh, but uh, sometimes they can report to the CFO or the chief operating officer or even the CEO. Uh, this is accountable to the board of directors in this role and increasingly playing a larger role in the actual governance of the organization and to speak to things like risk, uh, not just cyber risk, but also just uh, operational risk and systemic risk. Uh, what else uh, did I want to mention here? Um, oh yeah, that's right. Uh, according to this, uh, you know, the larger role, uh, the reporting structures are often, you know, discussed and compared at CISO gatherings with some people arguing uh, that reporting to the CIO and the CTO could be a conflict of interest. Um, because the CTO um, doesn't, um, you know, want things to look bad. And uh, if the CISO is reporting on, you know, vulnerabilities and risks that haven't been closed out, uh, there could be a conflict of interest in that reporting structure. You want some degree of autonomy in your CISO. Um, but in the end, the role of influencer, uh, since the direct reports are usually relatively a few in number on a security team, you need to be an influencer no matter who, you know, the CISO reports to. Uh, and it's needed, of course, to build strong relationships based on trust and transparency, uh, inclusivity. Um, you know, these are the key to being successful in the CISO role. The average salary, based on some of my research, was around 280k. Uh, it varies, of course, depending on geography and industry. Um, relatively, in a <laughs> this was a funny note I added. There's a relatively new um, cyber insurance policy from Allianz. Uh, that includes a $500,000 CISO severance package. Uh, if you have uh, Cisco endpoint protection using Cisco AMP, uh, you're using Cisco umbrella, which is a DNS firewall, and you're using Cisco email security, right, to parse all of the emails and bad emails. And if you have at least 50% Apple devices, iPad, iMac, MacBook, if you have all of those conditions, then you can get a special insurance policy that has basically a golden parachute for the CISO of 500K for severance. Uh, which is good because if you're only going to be working in a company for 18 to 24 months, um, it's not that easy to you know find a new role um, after a, a breach event. You know, um, but certainly battle-hardened CISOs um, can earn you know millions of dollars actually uh, in their next role. Uh, so you know it's interesting to think about uh, whether 
uh, a breach is a, a bad thing, of course, uh, but it can certainly help uh, someone's career if they can survive that breach and to continue to move on. I think I talked about that maybe last week um, where John Scimone uh, was the head of security at Sony when it was hacked in 2014. And uh, he's gone on to have an incredible career. He's now the chief security officer at Dell uh, and he has 60 CISOs that report to him. Uh, so that certainly wasn't the end of his career and I'm sure his salary is in the millions. All right, uh, consultants and specialists. Uh, these perform many one of uh, multiple specializations and subject matter expertise. Uh, you may need someone you know, to work on any of those tools that I mentioned uh, or work streams for uh, endpoint management, vulnerability management, firewalls, uh, um, phishing awareness, you know, things like that, DLP. So the InfoSec consultants uh, are performing any one of these roles and it's usually meant to help stand up an InfoSec practice and then perform some kind of knowledge transfer uh, before exiting the organization, right? So these consultants come in to launch something, build it, document it, and then hand it over to business as usual once you've hired uh, someone into your team to take on that role. Uh, there's two kinds of consultant contracts in, in my mind, a business contract and a social contract. Um, I like to strive for maintaining a social contract with my team and, and with my consultants. Uh, so if I call you at 4 a.m., uh, you're going to pick up. And if you call me at 4 a.m., I will pick up. Uh, if your consultant relationship has devolved into what I call a business contract, which would be mutual exploitation, right? Time, uh, money for your time and attention. Then I really feel like you've lost in building a good security team. Uh, building an InfoSec team requires trust and commitment. It requires loyalty and dedication. Talented folks will work for less money if they love their colleagues and they enjoy their work. Onshore hourly rates of 150 to $250 an hour are not uncommon, uh, but you have to remember, you have to pay your own insurance and other expenses from that money. And also, if you're hired uh, via recruiter, uh, you won't actually see that in your take-home rate uh, because they have a business to run and they earn a percentage of every dollar that gets charged uh, for you. Uh, but of course, they can find many more opportunities than you can as an independent consultant. So if you go through a recruiter, you may be billable at 170 to the organization, but you won't be necessarily seeing that 170 an hour take home. Uh, they'll take a, you know, a, a chunk off of that, of course, to run the recruiting company. Uh, but anyway, you usually can't get the same kind of gigs as an independent consultant. Uh, so those are some of the trade-offs. If you're working for a larger organization, you can get lots of really good experience for a couple of years uh, working through recruiters. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the InfoSec budget now that we've talked a little bit about the teams and the roles. Uh, most organizations are not going to have all of these titles filled, or even most of them. Uh, but the roles will often sit with specific individuals and sometimes maybe in other teams. Uh, if you're lucky, 10% of the IT budget will go to the security team, right, for the InfoSec. Uh, and these are just rough calculations. Another way to measure how much the InfoSec budget should be, 2% of revenue. 10% uh, of the IT budget is actually a luxury. A lot of uh, government and smaller companies uh, government organizations and smaller organizations that aren't in well-funded like financial services operate with a maybe a three to five percent ratio of the entire IT budget. Uh, so for example if you have a 20 million IT budget it's reasonable at least like I said within financial services uh, to expect a two million dollar infosec budget right ten percent. Uh, not everyone unfortunately gets that much so a combination of commercial and open source solutions are often employed to help mitigate the risk, right? If you can't buy uh, all of those tools you need, there are often quite good uh, open source equivalents that you can stand up. Uh, there's a bit of a soft cost involved in maintaining these tools. Uh, you're not paying a vendor to do it. Uh, in a lot of organizations, it's a very healthy sign to tend to buy commercial off the shelf solutions rather than homegrown open source uh, because of that maintenance burden. Uh, you wanna be able to hire somebody that just walks in off the street that already knows how to use you know, a phishing testing platform or a particular DLP solution rather than trying to you know, cobble together your own. Uh, there's a documentation burden and a knowledge transfer uh, that uh, is incurred uh, for homegrown. So if it's not really your core competency as a team, uh, you may want to of course outsource it. For example, outsourcing the SOC uh, and the tier one analyst and tier two analyst functions, or even MSSPs, you know, doing the entire, uh, you know, uh, managed threat and response, MTR solutions, where they'll come in and fix things for you. And so your team just needs to be there to help answer questions and to provide the necessary access. When you're building a team, it's a well-published factoid that the global information security workforce 
is about three million short of a full team. Um, and that means that there's a lot of jobs out there. Uh, there's no lack of opportunities uh, with this uh, skill set and to grow in this area. Um, I like to look at the InfoSec candidate pipeline, a bit of an overview. Uh, you do resume searches, then phone screens, and at least prior to COVID, we would then move into on-site rounds of interviews. Uh, it can be cheaper, for example, to grow an InfoSec talent than to just hire them. Uh, there's so much competition out there for folks with uh, these hard skills, right? You know the difference between hard skills and soft skills. Um, hard skills are, you know, quantifiable ability to take a test, do a take-home exercise, understand how tools work. Soft skills are your ability to, you know, uh, influence people, to speak, you know, to get along, uh, to, uh, you know, identify, you know, uh, people's strengths and weaknesses. Those are considered, you know, soft skills. Um, but these hard skills in InfoSec are, are priceless. Uh, so instead, maybe take some promising talent uh, from the help desk uh, or from one of the engineering teams and see if they have a knack for DevSecOps, as it's called. Uh, are they lazy enough uh, to be good sysadmins, meaning infrastructure as code, committing these things you know, to a repo and making them repeatable and consistent? Do they have an instinct to document and to make use of good ideas and scripts and tools of others in the community? Uh, rather than writing something themselves, I like to find engineers uh, when I have open headcount uh, who know how to source the community for, you know, someone's already solved this problem that you're looking at. You need to go and find that solution, find one with a support uh, and an active community supporting the open source tool or the particular script that you're using to do management of endpoints, things like that. Uh, always uh, assume someone's already solved the problem, you just need to find it. Uh, building a team. When I read hundreds of resumes and I screen dozens of candidates and I interview a handful of candidates, I think my um, throughput is usually, what, 3%? of the people that I phone screen uh, make it through to an on-site round. Um, I do actually work with recruiters in-house or external. And what I'll do sometimes is set up what, a, what might be referred to as a speed dating interview round with six or more candidates right at the start of a job search uh, for an open rec. That way we can get a really good feedback loop established as to what was good in the candidate qualities and allocate maybe a half a day to do this, right? Just a half an hour with, um, with each of them. Um, and uh, once that's been done, the quality of the candidates in the pipeline usually improves dramatically, right? Because they've seen what was good in those candidates in that first batch of six or so. Uh, and searching for a senior InfoSec engineer um, does not, I should note, equate to finding someone with 10 years of work experience on their resume. In my mind, and what I try to communicate with recruiters and with the candidates, is that senior is more of an attitude uh, than an actual number of years since you graduated college or since you, you know, started working. Oftentimes the senior talent is set in their ways, right? The one with 10 years or 15 years of experience on their resume. And they become kind of, you know, set in their ways and inflexible. You can't teach an old dog new tricks, I think is the phrase. Um, so a candidate that's five years out of school could well qualify in my mind as a senior um, based on the mindset, right? And with their regard to their attitude and their problem solving. Uh, so I've developed a bit of a reputation for doing 20 minute phone screens. I check uh, breadth and depth on them, uh, some questions. Um, and I don't go too much into security to begin with because I look for a basic understanding, a core set of knowledge and skills about the internet and computers. So one of the first questions I ask, and this isn't really giving away much because the recruiters know it. Um, one of the first questions I ask is at, at a very high level, describe to me the difference between TCP and UDP. Uh, and then you know, if they say that one is stateful and one's you know, uh, connectionless, um, UDP being connectionless, obviously if they get that wrong or if they don't know, that's difficult uh, for them to pass the phone screen. Uh, but I may still you know, entertain them as a candidate, but I need this core knowledge. And then of course, if they get it right, then I drill down, right? I continue at the high level and just you know, increasing detail. I'll then ask them to describe the TCP three-way handshake. And so if they've studied networking and they understand that it's a you know, series of three packets, a SYN, SYNAC, and an ACK, and that way you've acknowledged the receipt from both ends and established a connection, that would be the follow-on question. And if they know that, then I'll continue diving into more information or move on. Uh, and then the next um, question, you know, filtering at this level, I usually ask a generic DNS question. So let's say you put, um, you know, nyu.edu into the location of a web browser. Ask them again at a high level, pretend they're talking to my parents, for example. Um, tell me what they know uh, about how uh, the web browser, you know, the laptop uh, running the web browser finds out the IP address of 
www.nyu.edu or any other domain name. And if they can talk about that, then I'll ask them to drill down into more detail and say, okay, let's put HTTPS in front of it. How does it establish you know, a secure connection? How does it go through the list of protocols? SSL v2, SSL v3, TLS 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, And how does it then negotiate which security uh, ciphers uh, and protocols that can be used for that secure connection? So if someone knows about these core fundamental things, uh, I'm ready to then bring them into an on-site round of interviews and then really start asking questions about uh, different vulnerabilities uh, and, and their experience uh, as an InfoSec um, engineer. Uh, another thing that's useful that I like to mention when building a team is this idea of um, Tuckman's model. Uh, it's called Fight Right. And so uh, Dr. Bruce Tuckman published his uh, forming, storming, norming, and performing model in 1965. Uh, he added a fifth stage, uh, adjourning, uh, in the 1970s. But the forming, storming, norming, performing theory is an elegant and helpful explanation of team development and team behavior. Similarities can be seen with other models, such as Tannenbaum and, and Schmidt Continuum, uh, especially with uh, Hershey and Blanchard's situational leadership model, uh, which was developed at about the same time. So what I'm going to do here is cut over to a short description of Tuckman's model. So I have to change my share in order to share the audio with you. So just a minute. Okay, so now we should be able to see it when I click on this and you should hopefully be able to hear it. Edward Musio, CEO of Group Harmonics, and today I'm here to talk to you about Tuckman's model, how to fight right on your team. When we work in teams, we tend to think we're supposed to get along all the time. There should never be any conflict. Is the audio there? Yeah, I can hear the, the video's audio. I'm Edward Musio, CEO of Group Harmonics, and today I'm here to talk to you about Tuckman's model, how to fight right on your team. When we work in teams, we tend to think we're supposed to get along all the time. There should never be any conflict. But some conflict can be good for teams. It can help us to get to the next level. The trick to knowing the difference between healthy conflict and damaging conflict is to know something about team dynamics. Bruce Tuckman was somebody who studied team dynamics in the 60s. He worked for the Navy, he studied teams there, and he did a comprehensive literature search of all the work that had been done to date about teams. He figured out four general stages of team development, which all teams go through in their dynamics. The first stage he called forming. In this stage, this is when the team members are coming together for the first time. They're talking about why are we here, what are we doing, what's our goal, what's our purpose. After that is when conflict starts to happen. That's the next stage. It's called storming. In storming, what you have is different people going in different directions. No one can agree, and it seems like chaos. If you're lucky, you get through storming and you move into the third stage, which is called norming. In norming, people are starting to go in the same direction. There's starting to be some agreement, starting to be some output. If you're lucky, you move from there to the fourth stage, which he called performing. In the performing stage, that's when everyone's working like a well-oiled machine. Everyone's going in the right direction. Everyone's moving together in unison. Now, obviously, you get better performance as you move up the model. So it's to your advantage to get up here if you can. Here's how you do that. When the team is forming, what you're focusing on is goals. What are we as a team trying to accomplish? Coming to agreement on our purpose as a group. That way, when the storming, when the fighting starts, we can fight and argue about roles and strategies. What are we trying to do? How are we going to do it? What's our plan? The role should refer back to the shared goals. That's the good kind of fighting. We're arguing over the common goal, how we're going to get there. If you get through that, that way the norming becomes focusing on norms. These are the roles and strategies understood and agreed upon. These norms refer back to the roles, which refer back to the shared goals. That's the only way to move forward into the performing stage. Now, today's teams, we change membership and change purpose a lot more often than they did in the 60s. And so some people have proposed one more phase of the model that goes like this, that's called reforming. This means 
when we change the people on the team or change the purpose of the team, we sort of fall back down the model. This happens a lot today, but the point is still the same. Focus on shared goals first, make sure everyone understands them. That way, when you start fighting, make sure you're fighting about roles and strategies based on shared goals. That way you're fighting about the right things. You don't deteriorate into bickering or petty arguing. If you can stay focused that way, keep your fighting on the right track, you'll move into performing and get a lot more out of your team. Good luck. Switch back. Um, just a second. Where did that go? Um, screen share. Back to Google Chrome. And audio. Switch back to the mic. All right. So hopefully that came through. Um, last time I did this, uh, it was uh, visible and audible. Um, if not, uh, you can check the slides um, later to um, find the link for the video and watch it. All right. All right, next up. Um, tools. Tools are a necessary ingredient to any effective information security program, but they are not sufficient. Uh, Pre-breach CISOs, they tend to focus more on tools, actually. Uh, Post-breach CISOs realize that people and process are actually far more important. And of course, at the center of uh, these three things is data. Data is the one thing these days. Data is gold, right? Data is what we're protecting. Data is why information security exists, uh, to keep certain data available uh, in, in the integrity of the data and the confidentiality of the data. Um, for example, in an all hands on deck situation during a breach or ransomware uh, outbreak, uh, that can be a real liability, right? If everyone that's responding to the incident uh, doesn't understand their role, doesn't follow process, uh, the people and the process, you know, is much, much more important than the actual tools that you have in place uh, to detect and remediate. And so, like I said, that's a real liability. Um, someone could be deleting uh, forensic evidence because they're trying to get the bad guys you know, off of the server or off of the system or out of the network. And you could be destroying evidence that you might need for a criminal investigation later or to figure out how the system got breached. And so it's important to understand uh, that process has to be maintained um, and that uh, tools are helpful, uh, but not the most important. Uh, let's see, this slide I think was in last week's deck but it bears mentioning and repeating uh, that make sure your work is uh, focused not only on proving the people dimension, uh, but also the culture of the organization. Changing mindset is just as important as changing a tool set, right? Or at least bringing in tools if they didn't have any to do certain uh, security functions. Um, so before you, um, you know, how do you go about transforming mindset and culture and, and, and instilling a, a sense of security DNA into the organization? Oh, and this is, I think, where I mentioned John Simone, currently the CSO for Dell, um, has 60 CISOs that report to him. He was the global CISO for only two months uh, at Sony when it was hacked in November of 2014. Uh, but there is life after breaches, and perhaps, like I said, a, batter, a battle scarred CISO might be a better hire. Um, let's see what's next. Uh, okay. Uh, this was uh, a bit of a branding uh, discussion that I wanted to introduce here when we're talking about team building and culture and mindset. So a one word culture values exercise. Information security is not a product, uh, but sometimes it's helpful to think like a product manager when taking on culture change. We really don't have security 1.0 and security 2.0, right? It's a constantly moving river. As the Greek philosopher and historian uh, Heraclitus once said, you can never step into the same river twice. Uh, and to me, that's a great analogy, very powerful uh, in terms of the constant changing nature of risk. Uh, it's the water of the river. It changes color. It changes the sound. It changes its flow, you know, uh, by season and by day, even uh, depending on what's happening in that river of risk and in the environment that's changed. And Heraclitus meant for us to also think about how we are different when we step up to that river. I'm not the same CISO and my attack surface is not the same January, February of 2021 as it was with 2020 prior to the pandemic. A lot has changed. Uh, so anyway, for a genuine and authentic collection of core values and to do this one word core values exercise, which I'll explain in a minute, uh, it's important 
to source widely within the company. You want a bottom up consensus. It's much more powerful than, than the top down management view of, of core values. If you're gonna identify what those core values are, it should be organic and intrinsic to the business. Digital transformation of a company is, is like a journey on a river. You may choose to raft the rapids and to get to a new stretch of the river quickly. Other journeys are more like a lazy oxbow in the river where you have a beer in your hand and you're floating on an inner tube. Uh, what is your, your company's digital journey? How quickly do they want to transform? And so these things can help inform how to set a successful uh, culture changing and mindset changing exercise. So let's take a look at the auto industry for a minute. One word, Honda, Mercedes, Volvo, BMW, Tesla. It can take decades for a company to come to own one word, right, for their brand. In five to 10 years, what word does your company want to own, right? Um, organic traffic to your site and also paid keywords uh, for search engine optimization in Google and other search engines. How does security play into that? Uh, trust, reliability, resilience, oversight, observability, audit, compliance. These are all sorts of words that could be part of your brand uh, pyramid. And uh, brand pyramids are, are, according to an article um, that I saw in firstround.com, which has to do with uh, venture capital funding and uh, brand management. There's a great uh, example in there about three tools uh, that Netflix used to build its world-class brand. And you start by understanding your product attributes, and then you describe your product benefits, and then you get into the emotions, right? What does the product do and how does it make you feel? And then on top of the brand period is values. What are the core values? What is the mission of your organization, of your brand? And so for me, um, these were the words that mapped. Now, everyone, of course, wants all of these words to apply to their car brand. But in general, Honda is, is associated with reliability, uh, Mercedes with luxury, uh, Volvo with safety, BMW with performance, and Tesla with innovation. So like I said, it can take decades to come to own a particular word. Uh, but where do you want to be with that uh, you know, in your own company? And how do you sort of build that into the mission of your InfoSec team? Uh, and that's why I'm talking about people, process, and tools today. Uh, this is an important part of, of building that, uh, that culture and making it uh, genuine and authentic. Uh, the other thing that's useful to mention here is, and I'm going to dive into this as well to show it to you. If you've never seen this before, um, uh, the Netflix uh, manifesto from 2009 uh, is a great deck, uh, a Netflix on culture of freedom and responsibility. Um, the company can be, you know, the company values can be expressed in, in, in core value statements uh, and not just tacitly learned uh, and kind of felt by everyone. You can make them explicit. Uh, they may or may not be explicitly communicated though. Uh, good companies, of course, do try to identify them, write them down and echo them, amplify them and, and make them uh, you know, explicitly uh, conveyed to new hires over time. So Reed Hastings uh, of Netflix published this uh, slide share deck in 2009 and it serves as a great example of explicit communication of core values. So I'm going to jump into it in a second. Uh, culture is rooted in the core values of that organization that you're working in. Uh, when you're working to grow a security conscious culture or mindset, it's important to identify exactly what those core values are. What is the mission of the organization? Is there a published mission statement? Uh, can people find it if they were to look for it? Are there strategic goals that help guide projects and initiatives uh, which are in consonance with that mission? Or are they in dissonance? Um, or do they go against the mission, actually? Uh, Netflix, Netflix published this great uh, manifesto in, in 2009. And um, I think I have the ability, yeah, of course, I can jump uh, out again to a full screen share, turn off share sound, share, and then jump over to here and go to what slideshare.net, Netflix culture. I'll just show you a couple of the slides of it. Uh, this document is old, but it doesn't, um, you know, it, it, it ages well. All right, so 100% freedom equals 100% responsibility, right? People talk about um, letting, you know, hiring smart people and getting out of their way. Uh, so they seek excellence. Um, these are some of their values, high performance, freedom, responsibility, context, not control highly aligned, loosely coupled, pay top of market, promotions and development ideas. 
So in their deck, they talk about many people having lovely sounding value statements, maybe even display, displayed into the lobby, such as integrity, communication, respect, and excellence. Those were the words on the wall at Enron. Um, and of course, that was not Enron's core culture. Um, that was not really what was valued at Enron. Um, and so it's important to know that, you know, you can't just pay lip service to it. The actual company values, as opposed to nice sounding values, um, are shown by who gets rewarded, promoted, and who gets let go. Actual company values are behaviors and skills, right? And at Netflix, they have some really interesting, because they're competing for some of the best talent in the world, right? With Facebook and Google and Apple. And so they have um, these core values of judgment, and I'm just going to flip through a couple of them. You can read this later. Uh, do you have good communication? Do you have good impact? Uh, curiosity, innovation, uh, courage. And it's interesting, the courage one, right? Um, do you say what you think, even if it's controversial? Um, can you make uh, tough decisions without agonizing over it too long? Um, are you going to take smart risks? Uh, and you know, these questions uh, you know, and the actions have to be consistent. And then, of course, passion, celebrate the wins, honesty, uh, selflessness. Um, I think they talked about uh, brilliant jerks in here as well. If you respected everyone, it's a stunning colleagues. We like everyone. Um, unlike many companies, adequate performance gets a generous severance package. So this is kind of fun uh, to think about because if you were an average performer, you would think you would just get an average bonus and an average promotion. But Netflix's culture of responsibility and freedom is that, that mediocrity is contagious and you don't want a bunch of average you know or c or b level players on your team and in your company because it's going to hire more people like them right uh, and so if you want nothing but top talent and a players you actually have to give a generous severance package to people that are average uh, and then what else uh, suppose uh, yeah we're not a family it's a pro sports team um, and uh, the keeper test right uh, which of my people if they told me that they were leaving for a similar job, um, would I fight hard to keep? Um, but anyway, so lots of interesting stuff here to dive into and understand about uh, the culture uh, and building, you know, and understanding what those cultural values are. Uh, let me switch share back to the deck. Um, not that one. Um, I think I'm supposed to switch back. Just double check that that's what's showing. No, this is what needs to go up. No. All right, and then back to the notes. All right. Um, so yeah, that was 2009. Still a great read uh, to this day. Uh, so what you see here is a uh, word cloud. Um, and it's sort of a programmatic approach to kind of discover what NYU's uh, privacy policies. Uh, this was actually created from uh, wordle.net, W-O-R-D-L-E.net. And you can point it at a URL or you can paste and copy in a document and it will make the certain words larger, right? When they occur more frequently. So these word clouds can be helpful potentially to take some documentation and surface. What words do you use in your document? And are these really the most important aspects of you know, NYU's privacy policy, for example. All right, now we're done with uh, people. Let's talk about process. Uh, security architecture, application security, operational security, privacy engineering, high level designs, all of these things are best aligned uh, when they share explicit principles of design. So good security design is fault tolerant and robust. It is scalable, resilient and self healing. Uh, think of like an Ansible agent or a puppet agent that runs on a host. If someone makes a configuration change on that host, they haven't done it correctly, right? You're supposed to commit it to a repo and then deploy it. And so self-healing means the system will fix itself, right? If somebody does something wrong, because you don't want configuration drift. You don't want making, you know, snowflakes out of all these servers and being unique. And, and you know, the idea, I think the idea that's been referred to here when we're talking about self-healing and resilient uh, systems is that you have to treat servers like cattle. You can't treat them like pets, right? They, they can't be a handcrafted server that's been built up over time to do what it's supposed to do. Uh, you need to just think of them as being, you know, disposable uh, and ephemeral. And you make commitments and, you know, code changes to a repo and configuration changes, and then you deploy, right? And so you don't have these long lived, you know, pet kind of servers that are what you might call snowflakes. 
uh, let's see, another principle of design here would be segmented and isolated environments. Uh, next, uh, another principle evolving and reducing complexity. The more complex the system it is, um, the more you know fragile it becomes. And so you try to keep it simple, stupid, right? The KISS principle. Uh, a good principle of security design is something should degrade gracefully instead of failing completely. Uh, and of course, I believe atomic, simple, and modular components uh, can be recomposed in multiple ways and making it easier for you to pivot and change the business or change the application stack and the workflow. And so rather than having, you know, a, a complex system that's tightly integrated, it's better to have um, tightly integrated but loosely coupled. Uh, and of course, it needs to deliver security in depth. You can't just say that security is happening on the perimeter. You need host-based security controls. You need network security controls. You need perimeter security. Uh, you need security and defense in depth. Uh, and then, of course, a good design maintains the principle of least privilege. The user has all the permissions they need uh, to do their job and no more. Same with a service account, uh, whether it's a named user account or a service account. The principle of least privilege is an architectural design, right? Role-based access controls are back, it's called, where you have a read-only account uh, in a group and you add users to that group, right? You don't give permissions to users, you pr provision a group and then you add and remove users from the group to keep things consistent. Uh, and then of course it has to be trustworthy. Uh, shown here uh, is a series of photographs of architect uh, Frank Lloyd Wright demonstrating what he calls organic architecture in basic forms using his hands. Uh, these photos were taken in 1953 by Pedro E. Guerrero in a Wright's suite at the Plaza Hotel in New York City. And I'd like to bring it in because if you can summarize all of architecture and the principles, right, the atomic, simpler, modular components of architecture with a series of hand gestures like this in photos, um, you've done a really good job of, of you know, explaining, you know, the core principles of architecture, or in this case, you know, some of the core principles of security. And now some more on process. Our back, I already mentioned, role-based access controls, never add permissions to a user, always put the user in a group that has the required permissions. Within an organization, uh, roles are created for various job functions. The permissions to perform certain operations are assigned to specific roles. Members or staff or other system users are then assigned particular roles. And through these role assignments, they acquire the permissions needed to perform particular system functions. Since users are not assigned permissions directly, but only require them through their role, management of individual user rights becomes a matter of simply assigning appropriate roles to the user's account. This simplifies a lot of commoner operations, including adding a user or changing a user's department. Quite relevant for this would be uh, a RACI matrix, right? Um, access requests, uh, atomic requests for permissions, uh, principles of least privilege. Uh, RACI is an acronym that stands for R is for responsible. And you list, you know, what are the jobs and who are the people that are responsible for it. Uh, a is for accountable. So many of these particular functions and teams will be both R and A. Uh, C stands for consulted and I stands for informed. So for example, the project management office over there on the right under external resources, the PMO, they may be informed about a particular task or job that needs to be done uh, just so they know it's happening. So a racing matrix is really helpful if you don't have one defined uh, to make explicit what might be assumed uh, or what, what might be tacit rules about who owns what uh, particular tasks and, and roles and what those functions are. Uh, so uh, I've used RACI matrix to help clarify you know, who owns content updates on the website, who owns security updates, uh, who owns the availability and patching, things like that. So if you just define a RACI matrix in this way, uh, everyone can be informed and explicitly agree as to what their responsibilities are. Uh, one of the things that a lot of InfoSec teams have to do and help with with an IS function is um, you know, onboarding and offboarding. Uh, movers, joiners, and leavers, um, it's uh, often called. So offboarding checklists are great, but if you can script them and you can automate them and the access provisioning becomes much more better, uh, much, much more robust and resilient. So for example, create a process that includes how-to articles on a wiki, um, SOPs published for offshore and, and, and for infrastructure teams. Um, SOP is a standard operating procedure. Um, movers, joiners, and leavers is a key area of automation and improved security. Uh, and the discipline to manage user rights and permissions properly. Uh, what I find throughout years of consulting and working in different industries is that um, this doesn't always happen, right? People get, um, stay in a company for a long time. They may change roles. They may move from, you know, an engineering team to a product team or vice versa. 
they retain all of these permissions they had previously. And really, they should have all of their permissions stripped when they change roles and then reprovisioned uh, in order to maintain uh, least privilege. Because you don't want this accretion of, of permissions and uh, group membership in Active Directory over time. Uh, related to this, uh, I wanted to mention something about Kerberos ticket token bloat. So token bloat occurs when you are a member of too many groups in Active Directory. Uh, at somewhere around 125 groups or so, your Kerberos token reaches 64K roughly, depending on how long the names of the groups are actually. Uh, and there's a limit for a lot of things that you can use uh, for Kerberos auth. And Kerberos authentication is really helpful because uh, you can do pass-through authentication if the Kerberos ticket is valid, for example. Uh, so like I said, writing how-to articles on a wiki to help standardize processes and moving these tasks um, you know, to offshore teams uh, to help scale your infosec operations, for example. Uh, if you write SOPs and you publish them, uh, they can help with knowledge management and the consistency of the approach. And like I said, uh, movers, joiners, and levers is key for this. And you can avoid token bloat by using role-based groups instead of resource-based groups. So what does this mean? Uh, so you would have a group that would be named finance read only. And that can be applied to many different resources, right? Instead of having a finance, you know, G drive, for example, right? If it's a Windows file, file share. If you have finance G drive read only, and you have the finance S drive for read only, and you have the finance payroll database read only, right? You can see how there's uh, way too many um, tokens that can show up if you assign them to resources. Instead, you should do role based and that way you can assign that same token to multiple resources and avoid you know, this visual image here of, of token bloat. All right, now we're going to talk about tools. So you need to map your tools into the NIST CSF categories, right? The NIST cybersecurity framework. Uh, those five uh, categories are identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. Uh, NIST is celebrating, I think last year, its five-year anniversary. And the uh, NIST CSF uh, is a great framework uh, for you to adopt in your company if they don't have one. Uh, what's the job of each? Um, well, the identify category, you're going to be creating a, a CMDB, right? A configuration management database. All of the assets, you know, IP addresses, host names, what software is installed on it, you know, who owns, you know, the uh, asset. Um, a GRC ticketing tip ticketing system uh, for governance, risk, and compliance. If someone needs to perform uh, a request, uh, um, they should be ticketing it so you can quantify the work that you're doing. Uh, these are all in the identify category. Other InfoSec tools that fall under identify, um, authenticated vulnerability scanning, external assessments uh, by a third party of your security posture. These are the kind of things that fall under identify. Under protect, uh, the kind of tools that would fall here would be having a password vault, for example, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, running tabletop exercises, performing phishing tests, uh, enforcing SSO and MFA. These are the kind of tools that go under protect. Under detect, it could be a builder by um, a seam or a SOC, right? The outsourced SOC solution and analysts, um, scanning file shares for PCI, uh, payment card industry uh, data, PII, personally identifiable information, uh, GDPR scope data, HIPAA, if you're in the healthcare industry, SOX data, this is detect, right? You need tools that help you do that. And there are tools that will scan um, and find things. And then of course, response tools or respond category. Uh, this would be your incident response retainer that you might have with an MSSP, where let's say there was an insider threat and you needed to have some forensic analysis done on the person's laptop, they left the company under bad um, circumstances. You may not have the skill sets on your team to do that. And so if you have a retainer with an MSSP to do incident response, you can just ship that laptop off to it. They'll create a forensic copy of it and then start investigating it to see if there are any signs of, of whatever what the, the, you know, the user was accused of doing, potentially you know, working for a competitor or things like that. Uh, let's see what else. And uh, of course, you can have uh, outside counsel review your policies and you can also set up an out-of-band messaging platform. I like to mention this one because how do you tell people that email is down, right? You can't email them. Uh, how do you tell people the internet is down, especially when you're in the office and some people are working from home? So an out-of-band messaging platform, out-of-band, sorry, OOB, uh, is something that uses a different channel, right? So bulk SMS, for example. Uh, if you live in New York, you may be familiar with uh, New York City Notify, uh, which is um, from, uh, what's the name of the provider? 
I forget the name of it off the top of my head. But anyway, it's a, a, one of the major players that provides this service. And um, you can subscribe to an out-of-band messaging that will do bulk um, messaging and updates. I think I posted in the random channel uh, a misfire of one of these that was done uh, in Texas where they sent out a test message to people saying that Chucky, uh, the doll, you know, the killer doll, um, was wanted um, in, a, in a manhunt uh, for a, um, a murder or something. And it was a mistake and they had to, you know, apologize for freaking everyone out thinking Chucky was on the loose in, in Texas. Um, but anyway, out of band messaging. And then finally, the fifth uh, category for recover uh, uh, is recover, which has to do with BCP and DR tools and techniques, testing your restore procedures. And here I like to mention backups, right? Backups are useful for getting out of jail when there's a ransomware, because uh, then you can just restore from the backup as long as you're taking daily backups. Uh, the three, two, one backups design I wanted to explain. Uh, you should have three copies of all data. Two of them should be on different media, and one of them should be offsite. That's a good three, two, one backup design. Uh, so different media means you know maybe um, you know on tape and on disk arrays, right? Like a JBOD and just a bunch of disks. It's called where you have these things that are called near store arrays, <clears throat> where you're backing up all of your data from the primary spindles to a secondary, you know maybe less expensive set of um, storage uh, drives. And those would be on considered different media. One of them might be SSDs, right, inside the production server. And then you could have like 10,000K, you know, or 10K RPM disks, you know, that are actually SATA drives or something. A lot cheaper and you can store your backups there. And then that one copy offsite in case there's a regional disaster that wipes out your primary and your potential second copy. So that offsite backup should be you know, out of region or in the cloud or something like that. Uh, so we're going to go into each of the frameworks uh, in another lecture, each of these um, categories of the framework in another lecture. So I'll move on. Another interesting piece on tools. Uh, I wanted to mention uh, NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology. They have a special publication, 800-171B. It has now reached um, revision two. Um, the name of the document is Protecting Controlled Unclassified Information in Non-Federal Systems and Organizations, Enhance Security Requirements for Critical Programs and High Value Assets. So whenever you have a federal system and classified, NIST has a whole bunch of guidance for that, right? But these are specifically guided uh, guidance and, and recommendations for unclassified non-federal systems, aka the rest of us, right? What should the rest of us do? And so this was developed, uh, this uh, policy, this publication was developed in the spring of 2019. Uh, the first draft um, thinks, what, uh, was June 2019, comments closed in August of that year. Uh, revision two was just published in February of 2020. Uh, this document is remarkable in several ways. I recommend reading it, finding it. Um, again, this hyperlink is in the lecture notes, so you can download the slides. I put them up um, on my uh, Google Drive for the class later. Um, what's most interesting is the bit from chapter three, uh, where it talks about enhanced security requirements, uh, focus on several key elements that are essential to addressing APT. APT is uh, advanced uh, persistent threats. Uh, we have APT numbers you know, for different groups. Cozy Bear, the one that did the SolarWinds hack, is known as APT29. Um, and then there's other APTs that have been assigned uh, to speak to the you know, particular threat group. Uh, and anyways, in chapter three, it says, using deception to confuse and mislead adversaries regarding the information they use for decision making, right? What are the, what decisions and what information do the adversaries use for their decision making? Uh, in the deception program, and they're recommending everyone have a deception program because it includes this concept of, of deception. And here the image is um, a caterpillar, right? But this caterpillar looks like a snake. So the bird's not gonna go near it. And so this is deception in nature. So that's why I picked that image. Um, but uh, anyway, so it goes on to say, um, for decision-making, the value and authenticity of the information that they attempt to exfiltrate. So if you can lower the value of what they're exfiltrating or lower the authenticity of it uh, or the environment in which they're operating. So you can deprive um, a cyber threat uh, actor of only two things, right? Time and treasure. And uh, if you can make them take longer to figure out what's going on and you build like a quicksand software divine network and they hack, they come in and they think, oh, there's another network I can try to get to. And you slowly start making uh, the network response uh, latency increasing. Uh, you can deprive them of time while your team you know, responds to the uh, in incursion. Uh, 
So anyway, I thought it was really great to see the word deception uh, come into the Vogue. And there's companies working in this area that I'll mention uh, that are uh, quite cool uh, areas of research. So for example, anti-evasive technology. Um, using deception is shifting the focus from a reactive to a more proactive security posture. A couple of vendors I've worked with that I'm familiar in this area, uh, Minerva, they have deception uh, technology and solutions, and Alcalvio, uh, I think, which is Latin for something. Not a great name, but um, certainly interesting to check out. So what am I showing you here? Um, I'm showing you a photo of a narcoleptic chihuahua. And why is that interesting? Uh, well, um, I'll explain. Uh, Anti-evasive. So we're stepping up to the challenge of increasingly smart malware. Right, this malware knows if it's in a sandbox, uh, a detonation chamber, right, a microservice chamber in Bromium, or in a cloud, you know, micro VM that's detonating the attack, the attachment from an email for you as part of their service, and thus, this evasive malware, right, that's knowing whether it's in a container, uh, won't deploy and it won't exhibit malicious behavior, uh, and it, it it intelligently probes to see if it's in a VM or if it's on a bare metal instance, right, on a laptop before reaching back to the control and command and control endpoints. So I've had my interest piqued um, by Alcalvio's kind of honeypot on stereo steroids approach to detect deception, uh, where they deploy, you know, like 2x the number of EC2 instances as your production environment, because you've cut your attack surface in half or you know, by two thirds uh, by deploying all these decoys. And some of these are full on OS decoys where the bad guys think they've actually taken over a Windows machine. Um, and I've also been looking at Minerva Labs uh, anti-evasion thinking to try to address what we call the last quartile of risk, right? It's easy to hit the first and second quartiles. You get 50% of your risk coverage done. Third quartile takes a bit more work. It's the final quartile of risk though, that, that end of the curve, right? That's hardest to close out. That's where you know, anti-evasive technology and deception technology is kind of picking up and, and helping close out some of these risks. Because what you're effectively doing is you're lying to all of those system calls that the malware is making. And you're convincing the malware to remain dormant because it thinks you know uh, one uh, another malware package has already owned the device because sometimes they check to see if the Russians have um, infected the machine and they look for signs of, oh, did North Koreans you know, already take over this computer? I'm gonna go check for signs of that. And if they see that it has been, they may not do anything, right? Or they may try to uninstall the Russians you know, or the Iranians or the Chinese you know, malware and then replace it with their own. But anyway, it's a serious mitigation tool. Um, uh, uh, and whether or not any of that tooling is present, you know, even if it's not, you know, you can still populate your registry full of, um, you know, things that say, yes, we have Carbon Black, yes, we have CrowdStrike, and just add the registry keys because this evasive malware might see that and decide not to, um, not to, uh, not to deploy, right, its next phase behavior. This would have worked, for example, with some of the stuff that was happening uh, with SolarWinds. Um, and so I took uh, the Stanford Center for Sleep Research on narcoleptic dogs. Narcoleptic dogs are um, bred uh, to fall asleep whenever they're feeling threatened, which is not a very good evolutionary you know, tactic. It's kind of counter to evolutionary. And so I think, um, I forget the name of the dog actually in this photo, um, but uh, anyway, so he's a narcoleptic uh, chihuahua that's part of the uh, Stanford Sleep Research uh, where they're trying to figure out you know, uh, uh, how to solve uh, for some of the problems of narcolepsy. Um, all right, another bit that I want to go into now that we're into the section on tools, uh, let's dig into some Unix commands related to identity management. So LDAP search, Telnet, last, who is, SSH, who, and map, GPG, and let's look up in Traceroute. So I'm just going to run through a couple of these to make sure you're familiar with some of the tools uh, that I use all the time. Uh, Curl is another one that I use um, a lot as well, uh, and a tool called Sublister. But anyway, I'll talk about those later. Uh, it's pretty rudimentary for a lot of you, right? Anyone that's in this class that has done any kind of computer science um, classes will be familiar with most, if not all of these commands. But there could be a few of you, you know, that this is new. So I thought I'd rather at least hit the com least common denominator and talk about these each of these tools for a few minutes. So LDAP search. Uh, LDAP is a lightweight directory access protocol. Uh, LDAP search, you can run this on a Mac um, or you can install it on a Linux machine. In this example, I'm querying um, forumsys.com. They've set up a publicly available LDAP instance for testing. And you can see I'm passing in um, a dash D argument and then a common name, read only admin. DC is, is one of the domain components, example. And then the last piece is com, so example.com. And then there's a password and uh, what else? Um, 
uh, what can, the results of this LDAP search come back uh, as saying this you know service name is read only admin, the common name is read only admin, the object class is an inet person org, and uh, the user password uh, a hash of it. Um, so LDAP search is useful you know, to figure out what properties and membership um, a person or user has or a service account. Uh, last is a tool that I like to use. You just type the word last and it tells you who were the last people logged in. Uh, in this case, it shows root logged in and these are what from uh, 2014 and the uh, file that maintains who's lost logged in most recently. Because uh, if there was an incident that it fired off, you want to know who was logged in at that time, right? And how long they were logged in. And so it can show here, for example, that uh, root is logged in on pseudo terminal zero and pseudo terminal one, uh, still logged in Jan 28 uh, from 2014. Uh, so the last com command is, is helpful and useful uh, to know who logged in and who was the last person to log in. SSH is a secure shell. Uh, so here I'm SSHing to a server called nobu.eclectic.com. I log in and I type who. Uh, who is an interesting command, right? Because who says who's logged in now? Um, and you can actually type W as well, which is a shorthand version of who, and it shows you even more. Uh, like, for example, what was the last command that the person performed? So here I'm typing who, and it shows I'm on pseudo terminal zero, and I came in when I did this um, in 2020, and I was connected on a Verizon Fios IP address, right? Pool 108.141.209.99. And I'm then you know, shown the login prompt uh, on Nobu, which is username at short name, host name, and then a dollar sign prompt. Uh, so anyway, SSH uh, is, is something everyone should be familiar with. Um, it's increasingly popular secure shell. It uses an encrypted connection on port 22. Uh, and then Nmap, um, network mapping. So this is an open source uh, SourceForge project that you can download. There's a Windows version as well as you know, uh, versions for Mac and Linux. So here I'm running an Nmap command, uh, Nmap-R-O-SS, which is a, what a sin stealth scan. And here the dash P is what ports. So I'm scanning ports one through 3000. Um, dash V dash V uh, just says, uh, give me two levels of verbosity in the output. Sometimes you only want a little bit of verbosity. So you would do one dash V. And I'm nmapping something called ssh.blinkenshell.org. So it fired up nmap at the version at the time was 7.70 uh, in 2020. And it starts this ping scan, right? That's what um, was the arguments and flags that were being sent to it. And it completed it and it discovered an open port uh, on port 113, a TCP connection was open. And it discovered an open port for 443 and it discovered an open port on 2222. So this is a typical thing that I've run into is a lot of times people take the low numbered ports all um, TCP and UDP ports below 1024 can't be bound to by um, a computer process on a server, uh, whether it's Windows or Linux, um, without having root or administrator privileges. So a lot of times if you wanted to run something on port 22, you wouldn't be able to unless you were the root and administrator of the server, but you could run it on 2222 because uh, it's above 1024. So you can bind to that address with a TCP listener and you can run an SSH server uh, on port 2222. And that's quite common actually, uh, or port 8443 instead of 443, which is used typically for um, SSL connections and HTTPS. Uh, and it's important to remember you can run any port uh, and any protocol on any port. So you can run SMTP for email um, on port 25, the standard port, or you can run it on 2525, or you can run it on port 8000. Uh, and so that's why Nmap's useful because it can actually kind of gauge what is listening on the other side based on the response and the headers that it gets. Um, and it can discover whether someone's running something on an uncommon port uh, and map that out for you. Anyway, Nmap, very powerful command, usually a part of the Kali Linux distribution and all sorts of other um, security tools. Uh, another tool you use all the time is NSLOOKUP. You can do forward and reverse uh, NSLOOKUPs, right? You can look up a host name and it gives you the IP address. Like in this case, NSLOOKUP ssh.blinkenshell.org comes back with an IP address. You can also look up uh, the IP address and uh, if someone has populated a reverse DNS entry, then it will tell you that it was um, a particular host name. Uh, what we see here is that uh, ssh.blinkenshell is actually an alias. Uh, and the canonical name for it, right? An alias is just a pointer, a pointer record, uh, a C name that's called common uh, canonical name, uh, points to triton.blinkenshell.org. 
Uh, so anyway, that's one little uh, example reference there. Telnet. Uh, Telnet as a protocol and as a service is mm, seldomly used anymore. Um, but as a command, I use it all the time uh, to check any port I want. Right? Telnet uses port 23 as a remote login protocol. And the username and password is, is passed in clear text. So it's terribly insecure. No one runs Telnet services anymore on port 23. Um, but you can still install the Telnet client. And it's funny, Windows doesn't even come with the Telnet client on it anymore. So you have to install it, and I always do, um, because it's a good way of just checking, can this host reach this port uh, from you know, it's a particular target? And so here I'm telnetting to smtp.live.com on port 25. So the argument is Telnet, host name or IP address, and then port comes last. And if you don't specify port, it assumes 23, but no one's going to be listening on 23. So anyway, what I'm showing you here is me sending an email, or at least spoofing an email, to Microsoft. Um, so they're smtp.live.com connected. Looks like I got connected to a San Jose, California, um, acdc.office.com. It tells you the escape character. And so I started typing, and I did this manually. Um, I learned how to do this back in the 90s. It was great fun uh, to spoof emails. You type mail and then from field, and I would say god at heaven.gov, and then it would respond with a hello, um, H-E-L-O, that's supposed to be that way. It's not supposed to have a double L. And it says, oh, hello, heaven.gov. Uh, and then I want to say, okay, I want to send an email. And some mail servers um, will uh, say, oh, no, no, you can't you know, relay email from, from god uh, at heaven.gov through me, so it's not going to let you send that mail. Um, but if uh, I was just breaking down basically, uh, you know, how you might use the telnet command um, to check whether a port is open, um, and then you just control C to back out of it. In this case, I was showing a little bit of how you could connect to, to an Outlook server and start sending an email. Um, but it says client was not authenticated to send anonymous mail. And so it uh, closed the connection. Uh, who is? So who is records are DNS uh, domain registrar records. And uh, so I wanted to know who is live.com, right? It's Microsoft Live. Um, and you get the information back saying that what, um, you know, uh, it's registered through CSC corporate domains. Um, the who is creation date was 1994. The record was last updated when I ran this command, at least in 2019. Who is is uh, an important command for InfoSec just because you want to know, you know, um, what's behind, you know, a particular request. Uh, and you know, watching domain uh, registry expirations, who owns the network block that you're coming from, uh, and all sorts of useful information is available from who is. And I mentioned before the who command, um, and then I told you there was a variant of it called W. Uh, so just one letter command, just type the letter W and hit enter on a Linux or Mac. Uh, uh, it'll tell you what you see here in the second half of this output. Uh, so at the top, I'm showing you who. So it shows you M. Wilkes is logged in on console on February 4th. Uh, it shows me Ondell is logged in, that's a username, uh, on console as well. So that's two users on the same Mac. Uh, and then there's these uh, TTYS001, uh, sorry, 000 and 002, uh, which are also um, sessions uh, that are not on console, aka logged into the actual physical machine. So I could be SSH'd into the machine, for example, um, through, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah through a remote command line. And then when I type the W command, it actually shows you, you know, um, uh, you know how long they've been logged in uh, and potentially what commands uh, they most recently ran. Uh, GPG is uh, GNU Privacy Guard. Uh, it is an open source equivalent of PGP, which is pretty good privacy. <clears throat> and one of the exercises you'll be doing later uh, for this course is you will be generating a GPG key so that you can encrypt uh, information and then share it through what would be considered an open channel like email um, or through an open file share. Because if you GPG encrypt it with someone's public key, only the person that has the private key can decrypt it. And so you can share information uh, out in the open. And so, for example, I did a list keys command uh, on my machine here in this example. And you can see that I have my uh, old marvel.com uh, GPG key in there, as well as my nyu.edu uh, key. And so I can sign things and encrypt things using you know, multiple private keys and then send it to people uh, and they can decrypt it. And you can ensure that only that person is, is reading it. Anyway, there'll be a, an exercise on that and I'll show you how to um, generate a GPG key if you need to learn that. Because uh, that's one of the great tools that I think it's been around since 1990, 1991 when Phil Zimmerman uh, invented PGP. And so we've had really good encryption uh, technology available for what, you know, 
31 years. And uh, it's funny, now that everyone knows how to use it uh, because it's so powerful and so easy. And GPG is free, uh, open source. And uh, you can share and encrypt information as long as you don't forget the passcode that you created for your GPG key. And that happens a lot. So that's why I wanted to make it one of the class exercises is to generate a key and then realize you forgot it and have to generate a new one. And I'll have you upload your public keys into our GitHub repo download those public keys and then encrypt it for me to read one of your assignments um, from uh, encrypted text into clear text. Uh, trace route. Uh, so if you're familiar with basic networking technology, every hop, every IP address on the internet between you and a server uh, can be pinged and you can do what's called a trace route. And it says, okay, you know, the route from, you know, my laptop to home.nyu.edu. So you can see it went through a spectrum connection, right? Then it went through charter.com, then from charter.com, it looks like it went through Ashburn, Virginia in, in line eight. And then it reached level three.net um, in row nine. And then in row 10, I hit control C and I stopped. But what it's telling you is how many hops and how many, you know, what the latency is between each of the hops. So Tracerap is a good um, troubleshooting uh, tool that we use in InfoSec a lot to figure out where the connection is dying if something can't reach where it needs to reach and, and what path it takes. And of course, tomorrow the path can be totally different. There could be a cable that's cut, right, um, in Charter's you know, network or in Spectrum's network. And so the packets, because of the way the internet's designed, can take any possible route, right? Not always the same route. The shortest distance between two points uh, is a straight line in you know physical reality uh, and in the world where crows fly, right? Uh, but on the internet, uh, the shortest distance between two points can be very circuitous, right? It can go through the fastest network with the least number of hops and latency. And that's how the packet um, switch network was designed uh, to not be centralized. And that's one of the reasons why your first reading assignment uh, is to read about the history of the internet and why it was designed this way. All right, so that's just a couple of tools that I want to mention. Time to move on to identity and access management. So let me do a time check. I think we're an hour and 15 in. And I'm on slide 43, so that's pretty good. All right, um, next up. All right, a little bit of history of identity. Think about um, folks moving from village to village uh, and you know, kings and princes you know, going on what was called walkabout. Um, you know, shown here as a picture of um, Mickey Mouse, uh, the paw prince, prince and the pauper. And so the pauper gets to be the prince and then the prince gets to run around and see what the real world thinks about him and the conditions of his people. This is something that people used to do uh, because not everyone knew what the king and the queen looked like. Not everyone ever got to see them, right? They would know their name maybe. Um, but think about like medieval times and illiterate or pre-literate societies. Um, you know, you wouldn't know the king maybe by their dress um, and, and the fact that they have you know, on stately robes. Um, but if they took those off and they put on a common person's clothes, they would walk around. And so that was interesting because in you know, the pre-modern era, there was not a lot of privacy uh, of identity in a village. Uh, but between villages, you know, you could kind of reinvent yourself if you just left the village and went to another village and no one knew you because we didn't have, you know, telephones and you know, television and you know, newspapers and things like that. Uh, so I like to mention this when we first start talking about identity because things haven't always been the way they are now. Uh, in pre-industrial times, uh, a community actually knew everyone and everything that was going on. And oddly enough, you could argue that privacy was as scarce back then um, as it appears to have become recently uh, in the information age and, and ubiquitous surveillance. Uh, Dunbar's number, for example, uh, posits that we can really only maintain 150 stable relationships. Dunbar explained it uh, informally as the number of people uh, that you would not feel embarrassed about joining uninvited for a drink if you happen to bump into them at a bar. So that was his sort of criteria for defining who was on your list of 150 stable relationships. And it's kind of controversial. Um, Dunbar's number has been criticized, especially in light of modern social networks where people have thousands of followers, uh, millions of followers. It's not like Beyonce and Justin Timberlake, you know, have a meaningful relationship with all of those millions of followers. But still, um, it's, a, it's a, a challenge to this whole concept of whether Dunbar, you know, understood this fundamental cap or limit uh, on how many connections we can have that, that are meaningful. Um, and uh, certainly graph theory uh, and, and social networks, uh, where you talk about the strength of weak connections, and you know, the Kevin Bacon thing, right, or six degrees of separation theory. Uh, these are all interesting ways of understanding 
um, you know, what are our concentric circles of, of influence and uh, access and whether or not that's fundamentally changing or if we're all just drowning in, you know, social media connections and not really having meaningful relationships with all these people that are our quote unquote friends. It's hard to say. Um, I do think that things can change, but there may well be some kind of like limit or cap uh, on the number. Uh, the other thing I want to mention for history of identity uh, is that the English uh, first began using fingerprints in, I believe, July of 1858, when Sir William James Herschel, he was a chief magistrate in uh, Jungipur, India, um, he first used fingerprints uh, on what are called native contracts. Uh, Herschel had um, Rajahar, uh, how do you pronounce that? Um, Rajahar Konai, a local businessman, impress his handprint on a contract. Uh, to essentially frighten him out of all thought of repudiating his signature, right? Because it's his fingers, it's his handprint. Uh, the use of fingerprints for identity uh, first began for the English, you know, with the entire handprint. Um, but there's other uses, of course, since then, um, which was uh, what I think it was uh, for forensics. You know, people started to realize that fingerprints were uh, unique um, because of some blood work uh, that was left behind uh, by, like, I think, a French um, investigation. Um, but anyway, that's uh, more on, on identity later, maybe. All right, so let's dive in a little bit to the alphabet soup of TLAs. What's a TLA? Well, it's a three-letter acronym. And of course, it's best to have a three-letter acronym for three-letter acronym. Uh, InfoSec, like many other organizations, has a preponderance of acronyms. Uh, here's a few that we're going to want to discuss a little bit more in depth this week. So AAA, AAA, Authentication, Authorization, and Accounting. Um, IAM, Identity and Access Management. PIM, Privileged Identity Access, sorry, Privileged Identity Management. Uh, PAM, uh, Privileged Access Management. So you have a PAM daemon on a Linux host uh, that defines who can log in and when, uh, a, a meaning uh, in, in addition to other factors. Um, SSO, Single Sign-On, MFA, Multi-Factor Auth, and OTP, One-Time Passwords. So for AAA, uh, historically, AAA refers to um, networking, at least in, in, in computers, right? Not uh, the American Association of Automobiles. Uh, AAA um, refers to networking in general and to routers uh, in particular. Cisco, Palo Alto, Juniper, and other network uh, device vendors use this term. Typically, they support at least three methods, right? TACX, uh, which is a Cisco proprietary protocol, uh, RADIUS authentication, uh, Kerberos, which we had already mentioned, and LDAP, which I had mentioned before as well. Uh, in terms of authentication, there's three basic authentication types uh, comprised of something that you know, something you have, and something you are. Uh, the factors that work for know would be password, pin code, you know, secret question and answer, you know, mother's maiden name, things like that. Um, something you have, it could be a digital certificate, right, an X509 SSL certificate. Um, it could be a badge, a physical badge that you use to swipe to get into a door. Uh, it could be your mobile phone, right? Uh, that certainly acts as a second factor for SMS-based and uh, application authenticator apps running on your phone. Uh, it could be a key fob, right? A USB stick um, that you stick in uh, or a dongle uh, or an RSA token, right? That generates the codes every, um, you know, every, what, 60 seconds. Uh, and of course, something you are, that could be biometrics, like fingerprint, retina scan, facial recognition. And so you can have multi-factor auth with a, a combination of any of these factors. 2FA, two-factor authentication, is a combination of at least two of these. Biometric, something you are, is not really a good standalone authentication type or method. Why? Um, because it, it can't be altered. And once it's compromised, um, like happened in the OPM uh, personnel and management breach of uh, 21 million government workers, um, all of those people you know, had their, I think, 1.1 million fingerprints uh, were stolen by the Chinese in that breach. And so, um, you know, once compromised, it's difficult to trust an individual if you know that their fingerprint you know, if you see it in movies all the time, it's fairly easy to use a piece of scotch tape or some epoxy and glue and lift the fingerprint, make a rubber equivalent, put it on a real finger that checks for pulse and temperature and open up the biometrics. So anyway, it's not good as a primary factor, um, but it's fine for secondary. And it certainly unlocks all of our phones these days because um, biometrics are getting better, um, but it's not the most secure. Uh, and you can open up someone's phone even if they're not awake just by putting the phone in front of their face. Um, and of course, clever hackers like we've seen in films, they've shown that many biometric auth systems can be easily fooled. Even, even, even holding up a picture of someone's face gets you through some of these camera systems, uh, which is horrible, right? Because pictures of people's faces are um, available all over the place. Um, but maybe not as easily in the movies, but they can be fooled nonetheless. For authentication, there's four main authentication methods. 
static passwords, uh, active until they're changed or expired, uh, one-time passwords, OTPs, such as codes delivered through SMS and tokens that are used to access for each session, uh, digital certificates, so you can do client-side certificates as well as server-side, uh, and then of course biometric credentials. Uh, Yubico, it's interesting, uh, they're the ones that make those USB keys and they have ones that are um, Bluetooth and NFC, um, near-field communication uh, uh, radio keys essentially now. Uh, they did a password study in 2019. I think it's in the uh, GitHub repo under some of the research um, uh, uh, folders on the state of password and authentication security behaviors. Uh, approximately two out of three respondents, 69%, um, admit to sharing passwords with their colleagues in the workplace to access accounts. And more than half of the respondents uh, reuse an average of five passwords across their business and their personal accounts, uh, which is really bad for InfoSec, right? Uh, that's why these breach um, events and breach data sets that are being bought and sold on the dark web are so important um, to keep track of because it's called uh, it's referred to as uh, credential stuffing right someone used the same password for multiple accounts um, let's say you use it for your gym right your web login for your gym membership if you use the same password as for your corporate credential they can guess your corporate username and if you use the same password then they can potentially get in and so that's why it's important you know for making life easier for people um, you want to introduce you know a password vault for example to have unique passwords for every account they use uh, as an employee of your company and uh, it's it's fascinating to see you know how many people are reusing and most of us have you know 30 or 40 different identities that we have to keep track of so how do we make life easier for people and more secure deploy a password vault uh, authorization so auth n is is um you know what authentication is is who you are and auth z uh, authorization is, is what you can do so um you know here if authentication is the badge uh, then authorization determines what doors that badge can open all right so in the AAA, we've gotten now onto accounting so the log file uh, for the service uh, provides the accounting function right audit logs access logs right it contains the record of who accessed what and where uh, it's important to note uh, NTP, network time protocol, and time synchronization with regard to GMT offset and log files. Now, if, you have to make sure all the logs match the real-time clock on the wall. And this is not a silver bullet, but it does make sure that, you know, the machine time, uh, it's able to do its job by having a time sequence, right? Machine learning doesn't work if your logs, you know, if your clocks are off, right? And so every device that you uh, have in your network, including, you know, IoT, uh, Internet of Things, you know, cameras, badge, you know, door swipe sensors, they all need to know and match, you know, what the exact time is. And network time protocol is a way to keep them all in sync. But you'd be surprised the number of companies uh, and organizations that don't actually deploy NTP daemons and synchronize all of their clocks on all of their devices. Um, so anyway, for things to be uncontested and for the logic of incident response to work and for an analyst in a SOC to be able to figure out this happened and then this happened, the clocks have to be correct and they have to know what the time zone was, right? If you have servers in the UK and servers in Asia and servers in North America, they all need to know what their Greenwich Mean Time offset is, uh, or just set them all to UTC, uh, Universal Coordinated Time. Uh, and that way you can assure that the time events all line up, otherwise incident response you know, is very problematic. Um, IAM, so stages of IAM, uh, IAM maturity. Uh, fragmented identity is where we all started. Um, before any of these other tools and techniques came along, right? You had manual processes for access requests. You had an LDAP that was maybe separate from AD. Uh, you had self-contained authentication within apps, uh, especially with, you know, partners and third parties. Um, and then along comes unified IAM, which is great, right? That's the next level of maturity, where you have single sign-on and you have federated identity and you have multi-factor auth and RBAC. Uh, you have signs of, of unified IAM means you have automated rights management. This is uh, where everyone should be right now. Uh, and then next uh, in maturity comes contextual access. So context-based access policies, um, automated mover, joiner, and lever scripts. Uh, you have API access token management. These are some of the signs of being in contextual access, where it's not just persistent you know, access. Um, you know, the context of it uh, is, is important. And then finally, the highest level of maturity for IAM is what I would call adaptive access, where you have a risk-based access policy, where you actually bump up or bump, bump down uh, auth adaptive authentication policies. Uh, so you can move from two factor down to one factor if all of the other telemetry around the authentication event is the same, uh, like IP address, 
uh, user agent string, um, the make and model of the mobile phone that was used for the MFA calculator, uh, all sorts of these things. You know, you can have you know, 10, 20, 30 different um, you know, uh, signals. Uh, take, for example, you know, your bank. If you log into your bank from a friend's computer because you're you know, away from your own and you want to check your account or something, uh, it, oftentimes it'll pop up and say, hey, this looks like a new device. You know, please you know, tell us the answer to a secret question. Um, and so that's, that's adaptive auth. Right? It's bumping you up and asking for an additional factor, not just username and password, but a third factor. You can actually bump up to four factor. And it's kind of like um, uh, inflation, right? Uh, I think it was Saturday Night Live did a funny um, uh, script, uh, skit, uh, talking about uh, two blade razors, right? Because there used to just be single blade razors, then two blades, and then three blades. And so they were joking in the skit many years ago about having a five blade razor, right? A disposable razor with five blades. And that would be like five factor off, right? Um, of course, now there are such things. And so it's, it's, it's ever escalating. So what we need to do, and what I like to try to advocate is adaptive auth, where you have all these other reasons to believe that it's the exact same user today as it was yesterday. You don't need to keep having them typing the same password over and over again. SSO is, is not supposed to mean that you have learned to type your password a thousand times a day, right? We should let people auth if they have a valid Kerberos ticket because they're on the LAN network, they've already authenticated, they've unlocked their machine, they've gone through the badge and the door to get into the office when we used to go to offices. Those are already two factors, right? Um, badging at the door and logging into your laptop. So why do they have to type their password again to reach an intranet site? Just take the valid Kerberos auth ticket on the Mac or on the Windows machine and use that. And so set up um, NTLM access and let people do pass-through authentication um, and passwordless. Because that way you're maintaining your security posture. We are making life easier for users. Uh, I hate having to type my password all day long. I love configuring you know, SSO and MFA, but also passwordless auth and pass through authentication. Uh, so anyway, I'd venture to say that maybe 70% of companies are in the fragmented identity category. Uh, another 20% have reached um, unified IAM. Larger organizations have solved this usually. Uh, and then maybe only 10% that have really, really reached um, the higher levels of maturity where you have contextual access policies and adaptive access uh, in play. All right, for privileged identity management, um, a password vault, right? You wanna have non-persistent privileged access. You shouldn't be browsing the internet with your super user credentials if you're an administrator of a Windows machine uh, or if you're know, a root user, you don't log in as root on your Mac and then go you know, check your email. Uh, approval flows um, are used in privileged identity access management for system uh, sensitive system access. Let's say you want to, and you have a ticket open, you need to do some work on an HR server or a finance server. Um, you're going to have an approval before you're given that credential, at least when you have a privileged identity management program in play. Uh, you're going to have unique local administrator passwords. Uh, instead of the same admin password for a thousand laptops, you want to have a thousand different admin passwords. Put it into a password vault. That's the beautiful thing about it, right? Because then you can have that unique access. It limits the blast radius um, of uh, a ransomware attack uh, because oftentimes, you know, these hackers will get into a patient zero's laptop. The administrator logged into it, right? For a help desk ticket or something to, to do something. That administrator password might be in the NTLM hash. And so they use a tool called Mimikatz uh, to read that hash. They don't even need to know what the password was, but they just pass the hash and they can then log into the next laptop because it had the same administrator credential. So this idea of having unique local administrator passwords uh, is a big burden because then the you know, InfoSec help desk team would have to remember a thousand passwords. Um, but no, you put them in a vault and then you can just copy and paste them and get logged in. And then of course you have an audit trail of, of privileged escalation events when someone needs to become domain administrator to change a GPO on a Windows domain or something, right? Um, a group policy. You have this <clears throat> audit trail <clears throat> if you put that privileged credential in a password vault. So that's one of my favorite. Um, I think I mentioned some of the non-privileged access. What else? Uh, unique local administrator passwords. These are all parts of, of, of what I call a PIM uh, 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 work stream within InfoSec. Uh, so anyway, get a password vault if you don't have one. If you're working now um, or, you know, Certainly personally, you should use password managers uh, and definitely professionally. Uh, there's so many benefits to having a corporate approved solution for passwords and access token management. So don't be browsing the internet with your super user I mentioned or your domain administrator account, have a separate account for that and then vault the credential and only let people access it when they need to. Um, I think I also mentioned, yeah, you curtail uh, lateral movement uh, by limiting the blast radius to just one device when you have um, unique local administrator passwords. 
Um, you avoid the maintenance burden that would come with that by having them all scripted. And then of course you can have a, what's called a break glass credential. Uh, and you can put the credential for that in the vault. And if you need to see what was in someone's you know, um, vault, uh, because they're on vacation, they're unreachable, there could have been a disaster and you need to know a credential that they only had, you can actually be the vault administrator and you can open up that credential uh, due to illness, departure. You, know. you don't wanna be in a position where you know, only one person knew the password and they died or left the company, right? So it's gotta be in the vault, but you don't want regular access to it. And so you can have all this policy written around how you access these privileged accounts. All right, let's see, um, Pam privileged access management. So this would be the auto launch of a PuTTY uh, session um, or an SSH session for Linux, um, auto launch of an RDP session for Windows, um, things like uh, CyberArk, right? They have a password vault and they have privileged access management, where if you want to log in as an administrator on one of these machines that's got the credential vaulted, you can click on an RDP launcher, uh, Psychotic uh, software, they make a secret server, which is a cheaper version of the uh, CyberArk. Uh, it actually hands you that interactive session and you never even knew what the password was right it provided it for you when it launches it uh, which is great because then you can rotate the credential after the session ends and that way even if the person saw the password knew the password you know or wrote it down uh, it's invalid as soon as the session ends uh, and so this ensures what uh, machine readable log file exists um, it's got timestamps and commands of who did what uh, you can actually do video recordings of that session um, so that you can understand what the DBA did if they were working on a ticket to fix a database on an incident on production. So anyway, PAM is an important part of uh, an InfoSec program and tools uh, wrapped around it. Um, and I think for me, the holy grail of PAM and PIM would be to have like maybe a ServiceNow ticket and you can't even access the credential in the vault for the domain controller unless there's an open ticket in your name for that point in time, right? So you open up like a ticket for two hours um, and the user can access the credential for those two hours and then it auto rotates when they're done or it just simply expires the ticket after a period of time. And that's what's called uh, just-in-time authorization or JIT, right? JIT's uh, just-in-time uh, acronym. Uh, so anyway, that's the best way to do privileged access management and privileged identity management is to tie it into your ticketing tool. So there has to be a valid and open ticket for the person that's been assigned that ticket to get that credential out of the vault to do the work on the production system and then log them out when they're done, rotate the credential when it finishes. Because uh, even a key logger wouldn't let them in, right? Um, if someone was on a laptop that had been compromised with a key logger and they had to type the password or copy and paste it, um, it wouldn't be valid anymore afterwards, right? So that's the ultimate in uh, excellent security. Uh, SSO, I'm pretty sure you've all heard of it. We all use it uh, for NYU. Uh, we use what um, Duo to authenticate. Um, single sign-on, you can use SAML version two, you can use OAuth two, you can have ADFS providers. Um, ADFS is Microsoft's um, Active Directory Federation service. It has version two, version three, I think as well. Uh, MFA, we talked about this, uh, single factor, two factor, three factor. And then of course you reach adaptive auth. Uh, which is the highest level of maturity for identity and access management. Some of the providers in this space, um, Okta, Ping Federate, uh, SecureAuth, I mentioned I've worked with them before, really good. Uh, they can even tell if the mobile provider changed, right? If your phone um, that's running the Authenticator app uh, was on Verizon today and it's on AT&T tomorrow, that means you either switched your phones and took the SIM card out or someone copied your SIM card. And that's more and more common these days, bypassing multi-factor auth and hijacking the SMS messages um, and playing man in the middle or just simply cloning the SMS. Uh, you've seen it in movies, right? Where the spy... Um, you know, uh, is uh, sleeping with the uh, secret agent and uh, they go and take a shower and they go and do something to their phone, right? They clone it or they copy the SIM card or whatever. Uh, anyway, this uh, adaptive auth is a real world way to mitigate that risk. Um, Jack Dorsey of Twitter, for example, had his um, SIM uh, card hijacked and uh, his account broken uh, in that kind of an attack. Um, what's another provider after that? Um, Cognito, um, RSA Secure ID, Cisco Duo, Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, right? All of these apps are better because SMS has been deprecated, actually. Uh, One-time passcodes being sent via SMS uh, is no longer considered secure, according to NIST. Uh, and just as, of course, all the banks and everyone's getting on board with it and saying, hey, we finally did multi-factor OTP, one-time passwords through SMS. 
And they're like, yeah, that's not good anymore because it's so easy to intercept. People can run their own cell towers. If you've ever watched um, a couple of episodes of Mr. Robot on the USA Network, you can see how easy it is to set up a femto cell and to hijack all of that traffic because these cellular and radio networks are so trusting. If the signal's strong, it's going to send the, the traffic that way, right? And so all you have to do is, well, anyway, it happens in the movies and it happens in the real world too. All right, MFA, multi-factor with adaptive access controls. This is what I think is awesome, right? You can have device recognition, uh, a history of user agent identifiers. Whenever you browse a web page, it tells you know whether you're using Chrome or Firefox and what version, what the OS is. This is a header that's sent by your web browser to every request. So device recognition can be used, and you can have a history of devices that have been used. Telco carrier, just like I talked about, detecting changes and SIM swap. Uh, location. You can have regional and country restrictions. If you have no reason for someone to ever log in from China or from North Korea or from Afghanistan or Iran or Iraq, um, then you can just do geographic, you know, blocks um, and protect yourself against, you know, all sorts of attacks. Uh, there's also um, an adaptive access control, maybe called Superman. Um, it could be called an expanding bubble, right? Where uh, if um, two auth events, like if I auth here in New York, um, an expanding virtual bubble starts um, irradiating out from this point at 200 kilometers per hour. Um, and if I auth outside of that bubble, I'll be automatically blocked, right? Because Superman can only fly 200 miles an hour or 200 kilometers an hour. I can only get on a plane and fly from here to California at a certain speed. I shouldn't be able to auth, you know, 15 minutes in later after I auth in New York, after I auth um, or an auth request from, from a device in, in California. So anyway, you can put this into your code, into your logic that would just automatically block that. The only thing that you have to worry about would be maybe um, a systems administrator who's doing troubleshooting. They're going in through a VPN and they're remote desktoping into a machine in another location. So the super admins and the systems administrators may have to have that policy not applied to them the Superman rule. Um, what else? Uh, directory, right? You can do it based on directory membership. Uh, are you a member of the uh, finance group? Um, doesn't matter if you're providing the right username and password. Uh, with single sign-on, you have to tie it to directory and group memberships. Um, IP address. You can have static ACLs. Um, you can have things that are fed by threat intelligence, maybe crowdsourced, that are just constantly blocking uh, IP addresses uh, that are, you know, exhibiting malicious behavior on the internet. Uh, you can also block access if someone's using an anonymizer, right, for a Tor browser, a torrent uh, or onion browser and other anonymizers. You can simply block that because it's just too sus, right? Um, you don't want to, to let someone in that's using an anonymizer. Uh, and then, of course, behavioral. Uh, this would be anomaly detection for a time of day or a geographic variance, right? Um, if you know that your field, you know, sales reps are all in Florida, an auth event from Texas should be considered suspicious, right? And so that's behavioral. You're not saying Texas is sus. You're just saying this person is normally logging in from Florida and there's a variance there. And so you can have automatic um, you know, extra factor applied or you can send off an alert. You can block the access, you can you know, lock out the user. Um, you know, you have certain users that are on a roaming profile. Maybe you have some of your sales reps that work in your company that you know, travel the whole country, uh, other ones that don't. And of course, third-party risk, you can get scores from haveibeenpwned.com uh, or from other endpoint agents that show that, you know, there was a, um, a quarantine event on the laptop, for example, recently. So you're going to bump up their authentication requirements because they're at extra risk because they downloaded something or they browsed to a web page that tried to infect a Bitcoin mining software on their, on their browser. And so you can actually have adaptive auth that calls out to third-party sources and queries as to whether or not any bad behavior occurred recently or has the third party been breached, right? Um, Security Scorecard publishes these events. You can query you know, the API from your MFA adapter and say, okay, the user just authed and they're headed towards you know, um, a third party cloud solution. If that third party had been breached, you may not want them logging in for the moment until they've you know, resolved uh, the data breach. Uh, so anyway, yeah, here's what we're, what we're talking about. This is the most mature level of IAM can include all of these factors. And here's some of the features, you know, that I mentioned uh, for risk calculations. And of course, they can trigger a hard stop or they can simply bump up or, like I said, bump down the auth to make life easier for people. Uh, like a building management system, uh, CASTLE, K-A-S-T-L-E, uh, are commonly used for um, what are they called BMS, right? A building management system. So let's say you walk into uh, the Empire State Building and you swipe at the turnstile downstairs. Uh, and then you swipe at the door to go into your office on the you know, 30th floor or something. Uh, you can actually integrate um, an auth event and say you're not allowed to auth on a computer 
on the 30th floor unless you badged in at the lobby. And that way you can avoid, you know, people sharing badges. Um, you can also do facial recognition. You can have a high an HD camera on the door that identifies the user and the badge event, right? Because uh, you don't want, again, someone sharing badges. It depends what companies you work for and what the risk profile is. Certainly when I was working at AQR Capital uh, with $184 billion of assets under management, you know, you had some pretty strong controls. And we wanted to make sure that, you know, the badge that was given to someone is being only used by that person. So you don't have to invade their privacy with facial recognition and machine learning and AI. But you could certainly corroborate whether the person that badged at the door looks like the person that should have that badge. All right, OTP, one-time password. Uh, I mentioned already NIST has deprecated this uh, in 2017, actually. Uh, and it's funny because, like I said, most companies are still getting their MFA game on. And, uh, you know, they've created their first SMS OTP capabilities. <coughs> and they're already four years at, behind now in deprecating it uh, and getting beyond it using calculators, you know, uh, authenticator apps. Um, it's kind of like the payment card industry was finally getting around to enforcing TLS version 1.2 as the standard protocol. And this was defined 12 years ago, or 13 years ago, I guess now in 2008. <coughs> so PCI DSS, right? Payment card industry decision support system, I think it's called, or data security standards. Yeah, data security standards. Version 3.1 required deprecating TLS 1.0 in 2016. But the credit card companies couldn't actually get around to getting all of their payment providers and all the people that do, you know, um, uh, PCI compliant um, infrastructure to comply with the 2016 deadline of deprecating TLS 1.0. So they ended up extending the deadline until June of 2018. Uh, so anyway, it's not unreasonable, I guess, for us to think that some of these standards haven't uh, been fully adopted, even though NIST, like I said, de deprecated SMS as an authentication factor in 2017 for OTP. All right, so privileged identity management requires some additional discussion. Um, privileged identity management is the monitoring and protection of super user accounts in an organization's IT environments. This is not limited to just root and administrator accounts, but also payroll and, and executive accounts, uh, or more often the, the delegated credentials uh, to their executive assistants. And so it's important to note, um, hang on a second, I have to fix. Uh, Looks like uh, it's getting late and the lighting is changing. So let me just fix that so that I'm not washing out. There we go. All right. Uh, anyway, um, so getting back to privileged identity. Um, yeah, uh, executive assistants, right? They're sometimes the most powerful people in a company, right? The person that works for the CEO maintains their calendar, uh, has access to their email you know, and all of their accounts to help arrange for travel. They may even have a copy of their passport and their credit card, right? These delegated credentials of executive assistants are actually some of the most um, privileged um, credentials to be sought after. Uh, and so oversight essentially is necessary so that the greater accessibilities of super control accounts are not misused or abused. Unmanaged super user accounts can lead to loss or theft of sensitive corporate information, malware that can compromise the network. Super user accounts have typically been very loosely governed um, and often lost upon exit from an organization, like I mentioned, where the only person that knew it was, you know, the chief finance officer and they you know, left and they didn't tell anyone the password to the JP Morgan Chase bank account or something, right? You don't want that. Um, so that's why privileged identity management and password vaults need to be deployed. Um, there's a lot of trust, but not a lot of verify going on, right? You know the mantra, trust but verify. Uh, identity management software often leaves super user accounts totally uncontrolled while enabling advanced privileges on the corporate network. And furthermore, the owners of those accounts often have no formal training in managing them, right? Does the executive assistant have a, a course on um, proper password rotation and management policies? Or do they simply let the you know, executive choose a weak password that could be guessable, right? Like their birth year plus the name of their pet, right? Something like that. Uh, administrator and root. Uh, so how many root similar accounts are in play in your organization? Uh, think of things like Jenkins, Rundeck, Tripwire, Qualys, BigFix, Ansible, Shep, Puppet, right? All of these things have um, administrator credentials uh, because they need them to do their job. Uh, Jenkins is for deployment of CI, CD and, and code deployments. Rundeck is a way of doing a centralized job scheduler. 
and the run deck user on an account needs to be able to come in with the ability to start and stop services, aka privileged um, root credential. Tripwire, right? Tripwire is in there as an agent analyzing what's happening inside of various folders and watching for malicious activity. Tripwire needs to have permissions to do that, right? So it needs super user privileges or what we call root similar. Uh, Qualys uh, or Tenable, uh, something that comes in and does vulnerability scan. It can't know what software is installed on a server, Windows or Linux, if it doesn't have administrator privilege. So that account um, is also a root similar account that should be, you know, in the privileged identity management program and vaulted. Uh, and there's integrations to pull the credentials out of the vault so that the agents can run and the passwords can be changed and you don't have to worry about updating the passwords in the vulnerability scanning. Uh, Big Fix, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, these are all configuration management tools. They need to have root write permissions to update software and to deploy code and bounce services like we mentioned uh, with Rundeck as well. Uh, so anyway, there can be tons of these root similar accounts. Uh, the super user is a special user account. I think I mentioned this right for systems administrator and elevated administrator privileges within a particular application. So not only are there OS root and administrators, but there's also application super users as well. Uh, depending on the operating system, the actual name of the account might be root, might be administrator, might be admin, could be supervisor. In some cases, the actual name of the account is not the determining factor. On Unix systems, for example, uh, the user with the UID, right, the user identifier of zero is the super user. So you could call it anything you want. As long as the UID is zero, that's the super user. So regardless of the name of the account. Some systems uh, which implement a role-based security model, any user uh, with the role of super user or its synonyms can carry out all of the actions of the super user account. And the principle of least privilege recommends that most users and applications run under an ordinary named account or service account uh, to perform their work. And a super user account is capable of making unrestricted, potentially adverse system-wide changes. All right, let's see. Uh, password Vault uh, implementation options to consider. Uh, On-prem or cloud? Um, SaaS or IaaS? Uh, SaaS is software as a service. IaaS uh, infrastructure as a service. So those are two options for a cloud-based deployment. Uh, and then, you know, do you have API-based access so that you can script machine-to-machine uh, -machine, uh, authentication and rotate those credentials as well? Uh, let's say you have an integration account, you know, between, you know, tools like Google, G Suite, and Slack um, for notifications or for, you know, Concur or, you know, expense reports, um, Jenkins for deployments. There's all sorts of, you know, reasons for API access to a password vault. Um, how would you decide which uh, of these uh, options to choose for your vault? Uh, well, number one, ask a few questions. Uh, where is your infrastructure? If your infrastructure is already in the cloud, yay, you're already on a modern journey. Um, but if it's not, uh, there's not a lot of sense in putting it, you know, uh, in the cloud if you're not there. Although you might want to put it there to help raise the center of gravity, right? And uh, the pull, the gravitational pull to move your workloads to the cloud. Uh, but maybe if it is in the cloud, then maybe you shouldn't put your password vault on-prem because these connections would have to traverse, you know, the network um, upstream and that could go down and you don't want um, uh, a network connection disruption, right? An internet outage because a cable gets cut in the office building or, or, or wherever or a storm or something. You don't want people to not be able to work just because your password vault, they thought it had to be on-prem. Uh, your legal team might feel more comfortable and have a greater sense of control if the system's on-prem. But unless you have a fault tolerant redundant connectivity from your cloud to your on-prem data center, then you're creating a potential SPOF, right? A single point of failure. Some vendors of password vault solutions offer a SaaS and an IaaS option uh, where you deploy, but you deploy it, you know, in um, a VM on the cloud and you manage it and run it. Or it's just pure SaaS and you don't manage the underlying OS. Um, some of them only offer one of these options. Um, API-based access is not an immediate requirement for some implementations, but eventually you're going to want to get there so that you can have programmatic access to the vault and the credentials that are stored there. Uh, this is a bit of a bootstrap issue here that I have to point out. Let's say you fire up an ephemeral instance of a web server, right? Elastic compute in the cloud. You have four servers participating behind a load balancer. A whole bunch of traffic comes at you. Now it's going to auto scale to five or six servers. That fifth and that sixth server, they need access to the certificate, right? For the HTTPS cert uh, to serve requests. They need access to credentials to talk to the database on the back end for dynamic content. And so you're going to need programmatic access and you're going to have to bootstrap it into a trusted state. Uh, so again, ephemeral instance on a web server on the cloud, how do you authorize that brand new minted you know, VM uh, access to the vault? Uh, so here's where client-side certs are helpful. Uh, you can basically automate provisioning 
that creates that elastic compute instance, it will put the trusted certificate on the EC2 instance or on the container so that it can prove its identity to the vault before being granted access to the next level of credentials that it has to pull and the data out of the vault. Hopefully that was clear. Um, it's a good construction uh, to uh, deploy certificates to your EC2 uh, instances and use those certs to get them into the vault. Uh, so some of the password vault um, vendors, uh, LastPass, 1Password, Bitwarden, Dashlane, CyberArk, Tychotic. There's more than just this list, of course, uh, but here's some of the distinguishing characteristics that I've identified for these. LastPass is slightly better for delegation and for sharing. So if you're gonna do something one-off with an executive assistant and the CEO, LastPass is good. One pass, yeah, last password is good because it does uh, more delegation and sharing. One password is perfectly fine though for you as an individual. Uh, it doesn't do a lot of good delegation and sharing, at least not when I checked last. Uh, Bitwarden is open source for better or for worse. Um, their 2.0 release in 2018 was a major improvement um, and they removed several supply chain attack vectors. Uh, so you have to be careful if you want to go open source and not pay for a commercial solution and use something like Bitwarden. It comes with a plus and a minus, essentially. Uh, Dashlane, uh, they, they have a freemium model, free at first and then premium paid later. Uh, they launched in 2012, uh, but they uh, the freemium only supports one device and 50 passwords. And so if, you, if that fits your use case, then use Dashlane. Uh, CyberArk. This is the enterprise class solution with a suite, uh, tons of expensive, lovely suites of PIM and PAM solutions um, and uh, secure sessions and session recording. Uh, it was on-prem only uh, until maybe last year. I guess you know, when I say this year from a deck that I wrote last year, it would be anyway a year ago. Uh, and then Thycotic, uh, they make secret server. Uh, that's the product name. Phycotic is like uh, lisping, right? Intentional. Uh, and they're also an enterprise class solution with a SaaS offering. Uh, but I know CyberArk now has um, a cloud-based solution as well. Uh, a SaaS solution. All right. So these are some of the interesting uh, features available, right? Um, PAM workflows and approvals, uh, dual controls. Let's say HR and legal both have to sign off uh, on giving a credential to someone to access something, right? Think of the nuclear launch codes in the old movies, right? Where you had two people at opposite ends of the room. They each have a key. They have to turn their keys at the same time, right? To, to launch the nukes. Uh, that's what you can do. You can do dual controls with some of these solutions. Uh, you can also check in and check out uh, the password. So this ensures that only one user is using the credential at the same time. Uh, and then you can auto rotate after that um, in case it was copied to a clipboard or written down or pasted into a, a spreadsheet or a text file, because uh, people do that. Um, and then of course you can do, like I mentioned, the integration with ServiceNow or other ticketing tools like Jira, uh, no access unless there's an active incident ticket open for that server at that time. Uh, secure session management, uh, remember it hands you that session. You never even knew the password. It just hands you the login session that you need. And it has recording and playback features uh, and searching of what commands were done by the user. Uh, you would deploy this kind of session recording and privileged session recording management uh, to your production database, um, to your HR systems, anyone logging into it, you want like a, a really good audit trail of who did what and when. Uh, credential discovery. Uh, these are some of the features that you can get with some of them. They'll go around and find credentials that live on the servers and they'll find a local admin and privileged domain accounts and users on systems and pull them back in and, and make them managed by the vault. Uh, HSM integration. HSM is a hardware security module, um, something like uh, a Thales. Uh, this is actually a physical device, um, although now they're getting virtualized. So it becomes kind of a you know, misnomer to say a virtual HSM because the H is supposed to be hardware and physical. But anyway, hardware security module, AKA bring your own keys uh, for encryption chaining. So you set up an HSM and then you push all of your ephemeral keys that you need to run your cloud infrastructure uh, as a chained key. Um, uh, anyway, this is a more you know, sophisticated and complicated solution than most people will be dealing with, uh, but you can do um, composed keys uh, where not all the keys uh, in, in encrypting you know, the stuff in the cloud because uh, what is the reason um, for this uh, silent subpoena? Um, so if somebody issues a subpoena for data to your company, you have to give it to them. And uh, if it's not a silent subpoena, you get to tell the person, hey, I just got served a subpoena to give up you know, your, your details of your bank account or something. But a silent subpoena means that there is a gag order and they're not allowed to tell the user that they just broke you know, administrator privilege and looked at your accounts. And so if people want to run things in the cloud, 
and they want to protect or mitigate against a silent subpoena from a government agency because they have secrets or the privacy of their investors and their accounts and where they have their money and things like that. Um, that's certainly one of the reasons you would deploy um, an HSM so that you can revoke basically access for the cloud to read what's in that data. Because the cloud service providers can you know, obviously access this information when they're told they have to. Uh, think of Apple you know, trying to maintain you know, customer control over their privacy and over their data. Uh, they try to give the power to the users, but in the end, a lot of this stuff runs on the cloud and you can just come in as administrator of the cloud footprint and um, break into you know, the tenant um, VMs that are running on it. Uh, let's see what else. Yeah, break glass mode. I talked about that. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, where do you store the super user credential for the password vault? Because now you've created a sort of honeypot of all the credentials that you need to, to take over an organization and steal all of its data or steal all of their money. Uh, so where do you lock up the keys to your, 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 your password vault? Uh, so what I typically do is um, uh, write it out by hand uh, on a piece of paper. Uh, and be very explicit about L's and 1's and zeros and O's, right? There's a naming and numbering convention of when it's uppercase, you can underline it just so that people know it's an uppercase character. Uh, and then, you know, put a slash through your zeros and make an L, you know, um, uh, discreet, you know, writing like a cursive letter L or something for a lowercase. Uh, anyway, so you put that on a piece of paper, you steal, seal that piece of paper, and then you put it in a fire safe. And that way you have your break glass scenario where the super user credential can't be accessed by anyone unless they go into the safe. Uh, and then you do this twice, right? So that you're not single point of failure on the fire safe with the super user credential. So you put one in one office and one in another office in different geographic areas, and you put the same piece of paper and maybe a USB stick as well, you can put in the fire safe. Because sometimes you need a digital certificate to break the, or decrypt you know, uh, the database um, encryption for Microsoft database servers or for Oracle or other things. So anyway, there's all sorts of things that ought to go into a fire safe in order to have a break glass for the super user credential. And then lastly, of course, for some of you that are clever enough to see where this ends, because it never ends, where do you put the combination to the safe that has the piece of paper with the super user credential, which unlocks the password vault? You give half of the combination to the safe to one person, uh, two people, because again, one could be sick or dead or unavailable. Uh, so two people, each with half of the um, code to unlock the fire safe. So get a digital code, not a combination tumbler lock. Anyway, so that's about um, you know, as crazy as it can get uh, with uh, the discussion about um, break glass and where do you lock up the credential that unlocks all the other credentials and then where do you store the credential and the passcode for that. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing, but uh, it definitely shows that you've done your thinking about this. You know, if you propose you know, this um, kind of construction uh, into a company that wants to worry about creating a God credential that has all the passwords for all of the systems, for all of the servers in one place. Uh, and then of course, cloud service providers, they can't get at your contents of your vault. They want plausible deniability. They wanna make sure that they can't break into your vault. So they don't even give themselves the privilege you know, to decrypt something. It, and even if you beg and plead, they can't give you your decryption key. So if you lose your private key, you could potentially you know, create a big you know, um, security incident for your company um, by losing that private key. Uh, so there's obviously a risk to doing you know, um, such sophisticated chains of security and control. Uh, and uh, yeah, anyway, that's one of the scenarios that you have to, uh, to entertain because uh, they can't break into your vault. So that's one of the reasons why I think the cloud model is best for most people because most people's workloads are headed to the cloud. All right, so now we've reached that portion of the uh, class uh, where I go and, and review InfoSec in the news. And here, I'm going to switch back to full screen. And uh, jump over to our um, InfoSec Slack channel, which was here. Oh, that was HackerU. Um, and here's InfoSec News. And we're at the latest stories. All right. Um, and let's see, any interesting bits in here in the chat? I haven't been looking. Yes, we can hear it. Yes, we can hear. Would a nonce be technically considered as an OTP? Um, possibly, yeah. Um, since it's, uh, you know, uh, ephemeral. All right. Um, Mozilla fixes Windows 10 NTFS corruption bug in Firefox. 
um, not related to today's topic. Today was identity and access management, right? Um, so let's look for stories that are related to that. Uh, information security news. I'm in dev at a Fortune 500 and my manager is an A, uh, polite word, uh, who doesn't understand or care about security. Well, that's certainly fun to read, but not related to identity and access management. Uh, the great suspender Chrome extension fall from grace. Google has forcibly uninstalled the immensely popular The Great Suspender extension uh, from Google and classified it as malware. Interesting. I'm curious about this one, actually. Google has forcibly uninstalled the immensely popular Great Suspender extension from Google Chrome and classified as malware um, that will suspend unused tabs and unload its resources to decrease the browser's memory usage. When a user is ready to use the tab again, they simply had to click to make it visible. Uh, the extension was immensely popular with over 2 million users and had consistently been a recommended extension due to its ability to reduce Chrome's memory usage. Because every tab in Chrome uh, is its own process in chewing up uh, memory. Uh, when Google removed it on Thursday, users were left with a message stating that this extension contains malware, but not providing any further context on how to recover their suspended tabs. Um, interesting. Uh, with the abrupt removal of it, uh, users who had suspended tabs were upset that they could not access them again. Well, just figure your computer should be rebootable at all times, but maybe they were working on something, I don't know. Uh, is it possible to see a list of suspended tabs uh, in the history feature to recover the URL of the suspended web page? Instructions on how to do this can be found on the support page. Great suspenders fall from grace. In June 2020, the developer of the suspender sold the extension to an unknown entity as he did not have time to properly maintain it. At the time, users were suspicious of the sale um, and why someone would purchase a free open source solution that did not generate any revenue. As free extensions have been purchased in the past and then monetized with malicious changes, such as injecting ads or stealing information, users were concerned that the same would happen with the great suspender. Unfortunately, the user's concerns were justified when the new maintainer updated the version in October 2020 to version 7.1.8, which included scripts that tracked the user's behavior and executed code retrieved from a remote server. This malicious activity led to Microsoft removing the Microsoft Edge storage extension. And uh, for those of you that are not familiar, Microsoft Edge is essentially a Chromium-based browser. So Microsoft's finally gotten on board with doing something like with the rest of us uh, using a Chrome-based browser, but they've branded it as Microsoft Edge. But it's essentially the same as Chrome and the extensions are actually um, uh, swappable. Uh, Chrome extensions and Edge extensions. Uh, in a new 7.19 version be released without the malicious scripts. I don't think I have the great suspender because I never have too many browser tabs open. I try to be good about that. But you've probably seen friends or colleagues, you know, that have like, you know, a hundred different tiny little tabs across their Chrome on the top. Uh, the extension, though, continued to remain in the hands of these unknown developers who could introduce malicious code. Thursday, Google pulled the Chrome Web Store extension as malware, but has not provided any reason for doing so. For those who truly want the great suspender extension, the GitHub project continues to offer version 7.16. That's the final release that was owned when the original developer was there. Interesting. You'd have to go into developer mode to pull in a backported or um, less than recent version of the extension. Um, so that's an interesting story. Uh, certainly uh, stealing information, uh, uh, privileged users, you know, um, like I said, don't browse the internet uh, with your privileged users uh, because of risks like the Google um, you know, extension for the great suspender and how that was uh, potentially an attack vector. Uh, let's see, this flash player emulator lets you securely play your old games. No, not interesting for today's topic. Um, abusing fave icons and fingerprinting, not necessarily today's topic either. Injecting road DNS records using DHCP. Uh, interesting story, but not today's topic. Um, the PDF file format is broken. So someone's talking about PDFs. Um, there's certainly lots of interesting data that can be extracted from PDFs if you don't redact it, um, but that's not really an identity and access management story. Um, hugely great. Um, here's another copy of the uh, same one for the suspender. Every Google Chrome user should click this button now. Um, that looks like clickbait to me, actually. I'm not sure what that story is, but... Uh, uh, anyway, what else? Uh, let's see. Uh, write Windows shellcode in Rust. 
Um, no, not privileged and identity access management story. Cyber criminals now using Plex media servers to amplify DDoS attacks. Uh, interesting story, but not today's topic. Um, the new Chrome browser zero day under active attack update immediately. So you should be on 88043241150. Um, and I do believe I am. If I go to the um, about, I am on 8804342450. So make sure you check this box, right, um, to keep uh, uh, Google Chrome up to date because there's a zero day popping around that you don't want. Um, uh, looks like it's what a heap uh, buffer overflow flaw. CVE 2021, number 21,148 in its version 8 JavaScript rendering engine. Uh, looks horrible and looks like it's being updated or exploited, so update please. Uh, let's see, attacking NPM by using abandoned resources. Interesting. That's kind of related to the story we're talking about, right, with that plugin where someone takes over, it's like a supply chain attack essentially, right, to work on extensions and to buy or, you know, start contributing to an extension. And then uh, engineer a backdoor or malware into it. Uh, running a honeypot fake power plant on the internet for a month. That sounds interesting. Um, <laughs> how many people tried to take over this uh, fake power plant? Um, that's not uh, today's topic, but really good story. Um, this week in ransomware, data destruction. I think um, this one's probably worth checking out because uh, there will definitely be some identity and access management um, issues uh, in this story. So open that link. <clears throat> uh, let's see, February 5th, data destruction. This week we saw a few large scale attacks and various ransomware reports indicating ransom payments are failing, oh no, are falling, uh, while attacks are increasing, uh, destroying data permanently. So that would be considered a wiper, right? Where it uh, encrypts the data and wipes it. Uh, the good news is that new ransomware decryptor was released allowing victims to recover files for free. Uh, so if you're working in an infosec capacity and you wanted to keep up on the tabs of this story, this one's certainly worth reading. Um, Coveware is seeing a decline in ransom payments over companies uh, as they recover files from backups. Fortunately, Coveware has also seen an increasing trend of ransomware attacks mistakenly causing permanent data destruction as they encrypt data. Uh, if unknown, uh, if this is caused by buggy software or sloppy and inexperienced attackers. Um, I remember there was one particular story that uh, came up last year. Let me see if I can find it. it's relevant. But basically, in order to ensure that they got paid, a Windows ransomware was actually checking to see if Windows Subsystem Linux was installed, um, WSL, where it's not um, uh, an emulator. It's actually a proper subsystem running Linux on Windows. And um, they had logic built into the ransomware to not encrypt the files that were inside of slash root, slash boot, slash Etsy, right, slash proc. These are all the top level folders of a Linux file system that would live within uh, a Windows machine. And so I had the funny idea that maybe you just rename your C drive to um, boot. And then the ransomware would say, oh, I'm not supposed to encrypt that because it's Windows system Linux and I'm gonna mess it up and I'll never get paid uh, as a ransomware business if I mess up the system even after we decrypt it because it treated it differently, right? It's a Windows machine, but with a Linux subsystem, it can't recover the permissions even afterwards. And so, so they were trying to be careful about not touching the insides of a WSL subsystem inside of a Windows machine. And I just thought it'd be clever to trick the malware um, and just rename, you know, your, um, you know, your, you know, what slash users directory or your slash windows, you know, slash 32 uh, to be boot or root or whatever. And that would trick them. Uh, but of course, that would break a lot of other stuff that assumes a path to these uh, directories, even though they're all supposed to use variables and you can change and make your Windows folder, you know, whatever you want. Uh, you could call it, you know, root or boot uh, folder. But anyway, so this ransomware attack uh, is an interesting story that reminded me of that previous um, uh, story that uh, I had seen about um, apparently someone's not being so careful and they're accidentally bricking, you know, your, your machine uh, and you're, they're unlikely to get paid. Uh, if they brick your machine, even if you pay the ransom. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Clarity reports that adversary CISOs and researchers have all turned their attention to finding critical security bugs in ICS networks. So ICS is uh, industrial control systems. And here we're talking about um, SCADA, right? Um, uh, things that control power plants, things that control the grid. Uh, I built in, um, 
uh, energy management systems that controlled power plants when I lived and worked in Holland. So I know what that was like. And that was when Stuxnet came out back in what, 2005 or so. And it was scary because these things, you know, people would die if, if um, the systems uh, go out of whack. And so I think that um, a lot of people are turning their attention towards bugs in these Internet of Things and SCADA systems and uh, more uh, on that. But that's not really identity and access management. So let's see what else we can find. Uh, ransomware actor Alex says resentment fueled his career choice. OK, uh, unpatch WordPress plugin affects 50,000 sites. I think we talked about some horrible WordPress stuff already in last week's lecture. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, Friday Squid blogging. Um, Bruce Schneier, his security blog, he likes to blog about Squid news and then talk about security on top of it, if I haven't mentioned that already. That's why you're seeing Squid news in our InfoSec channel. Um, a massive squid appeared in the port of Izumo, Japan. Yeah, that looks like a big squid. I mean, I don't see a person in this frame to get us a uh, reference uh, size of the squid, but looks fascinating, but not our topic for today. Uh, web Dev Tutorials uh, site, site Point discloses data breach. Um, could well be related to privilege site and identity, and identity access management. So let's open that one up. Uh, web Dev Tutorials site, site Point discloses data breach. Um, admits data breach after 1 million user creds were sold on a hacking forum last December. So I guess they um, grudgingly admitted uh, the breach occurred because their data was being sold on the dark web. Uh, that's not really a good look, right, to disclose it after the evidence starts showing up. Um, but anyway, let's see, December it happened. Um, a website that provides access to a wealth of uh, web development tools, tutorials, and books has disclosed a security breach uh, and sent emails to some of its users. The company formally admitted that a breach after a hacker put up for sale a collection of 1 million user details uh, on a cybercrime forum in December. In a data breach notification, SitePoint confirmed the intrusion. At this point, we believe the accessed information mainly relates to your name, email address, hashed password, username, and IP address. So that's personal information, but maybe not social security number, date of birth, things like that. Uh, but you can certainly do a lot with um, that hashed password. You could uh, reverse engineer uh, the hash to figure out what it does in clear text. And then again, if people use the same password in more than one place, which they do, you can potentially break into lots of other accounts and corporate accounts with that information. SitePoint has now initiated password reset on all accounts. Um, this is a huge step to take. A lot of companies are afraid to take it um, if they have their own breach or even as a protocol necessarily for um, you know, uh, offboarding of a system administrator, right? Someone who had privileged access and accounts, you have to rotate these super user credentials that you know people are afraid to change, uh, or to initiate a, an all password or reset request, uh, reset request or initiate it uh, proactively on your side, because um, it you know, pisses off your customers, right? But it also shows that you care about their security. Um, so I think that in this case, I think SitePoint made the right decision. Not everyone does make that right decision. Uh, to initiate a reset uh, in the name of security. Uh, tutorials and book publisher believes that the stolen passwords are currently safe as they have been hashed with the bcrypt algorithm at Salted, which would make cracking the password strings to plain text a pretty lengthy process for the time being. I don't think so. I mean, if you've ever heard of something called rainbow tables, um, rainbow tables. Um, you can look it up on Wikipedia. Uh, rainbow tables are pre-computed table for the cache of cryptographic hash functions. And so the idea is that rainbow tables allow you to simply look up the clear text of, of many things, right? You just copy and paste it. And there's a lot of math here that I can't explain to you, um, but I'm sure the Wikipedia editors that made this page and wrote these examples uh, will show you uh, that there's a lot of, um, you know, cryptographic uh, strength, you know, to different hash algorithms, but a lot of them um, have been broken, uh, and so rainbow tables, you know, are a big threat uh, to um, hashed passwords because uh, they could be uh, returned to clear text, um, non-cipher text, uh, pretty easily. A lot of them can. Well, let's see. Spotify hit with another credential stuffing attack. Uh, again, privileged identity access management. There could be some FUD around this as well. Um, this is a good story. Uh, working at Security Scorecard, I have a Slack channel called the Breach Bot. Uh, because what we do is we track breaches of um, millions of companies that are rated and given scores by our platform. And when Spotify's um, uh, story hit the news, um, 
they were actually talking about Spotify user accounts, right? Not Spotify corporate credentials. And so people got up in arms because they confused the two, right? Just because um, a Spotify user used the same password that was a part of a breach data set somewhere else, doesn't mean that Spotify did a bad job with their security, right? So Spotify's score shouldn't go down. Their reputation shouldn't be tarnished. But when people write you know, news stories, they wanna get clicks and they wanna sell ads, right? And so um, this is the second credential stuffing attack to hit the streaming platform in the last few months. Uh, Spotify suffered a credential stuffing attack. You stole the credentials from 100,000 accounts a security researcher discovered. This is the second attack of its type uh, uh, in the last couple of months. Last November, 300,000 accounts were affected when an Elasticsearch database containing more than 380 million records uh, and login credentials was used to target Spotify accounts. And again, this is not the Spotify administrators or the Spotify corporate services. This is Spotify users, right? The attack was reported to Spotify, which used a password reset to the affected users that rendered the public credentials invalid. The company says in a statement that it also worked to have fraudulent database taken down by the internet service provider that it was on and notes that this attack was not linked to a breach in Spotify security. Um, but again, people get confused uh, sometimes. Anyway, um, users are advised to choose unique passwords for online services. Like I mentioned, this is a total identity and access management story. Um, in a blog post, security firm Bitdefender notes it doesn't matter much if a users choose a complex password if that password is reused across websites. Correct, yeah. And the password research um, that was being done by, I think, what was it, uh, Proofpoint? Um, showed that uh, people are, you know, have like five passwords that they use all over the place and they just copy and paste them. Anyway, use a password vault. Encourage your friends and family and colleagues to use a password vault. When you are working in the infosec sector, uh, make sure you stand up a password vault because uh, typically they're blocked um, by certain, um, you know, security tools and policies because uh, you don't own and control the passwords that are going to those vaults that's why you have to stand up a company managed and company owned vault and then permit access to it to improve security for you the users and the internet because uh, that's all what we're up to right um let's see nevada ways letting tech companies build their own communities no that's from state scoop i like following state's news as well as infosec news a lot of the times state scoop stories are very uh, relevant for um what uh, secretaries of state, um, state CISOs, and state um, CIOs. Uh, malicious extension. Uh, yeah, we were talking about that. Google Sync. Uh, oh, wait, this one might be something else. Abuses Google Sync. Yeah, that's a different story. Uh, let's take a look real quick. Malicious extension abuses Chrome Sync to steal user data. The Google Chrome Sync feature. Uh, can be abused by threat actors to harvest information from compromised computers using maliciously crafted Chrome browser extensions. Uh, though that certainly brings up an important point. Uh, the frontier of managing uh, web browsers, right? You may have um, a corporate policy that allows what browsers can be installed on various uh, corporate owned assets. And the next frontier to delve into is what extensions are allowed to be installed. Uh, you can do this through Google mobile device management. Um, you can control the extensions. You basically put a token in the applications folder on Windows or Mac, and then you can control and manage and see <clears throat> what extensions are installed on all of the laptops and workstations uh, that you control and manage. And that's the next level of protection, right? Because <clears throat> Bitcoin mining is going on there. Ransomware stuff is being delivered through Chrome, you know, uh, through web browsers and through malicious extensions. So Google's infrastructure is also up for misuse as a command and control communication channel to exfiltrate the stolen data to attacker controlled servers as security consultant Bojan Zerjana discovered. Uh, Chrome Sync is a feature designed to automatically synchronize the user's bookmarks, history, passwords, and other settings after they log in with their Google account, bypassing Chrome web store security checks. While malicious Chrome extensions are a dime a dozen, with Google removing hundreds of them each year from the store, this one was special due to the way it was deployed. The attacker's malicious add-on was camouflaged as the Forcepoint Endpoint Chrome extension for Windows and installed directly from Chrome, bypassing the Chrome Web Store installation channel after enabling developer mode. All right, so there's a couple of mitigation points that you could um, pull or glean from this story. One, don't let people go into developer mode on a corporate run uh, device and Chrome 
running on that corporate run device because developer mode is obviously the thing that was promiscuous that was being abused in this story and then of course manage what chrome extensions can be installed it's extra work people will have to open up a help desk ticket and say hey i'd like to use this chrome extension can you have the security team review it check it out see if it can be added to the list of trusted extensions that can be installed um, but that's better than having to chase down you know um, an incident uh, that could put your company out of business uh, if you don't manage your Chrome and your Chrome extensions. So anyway, centralized Chrome and Firefox extension management tools do exist. Uh, once it's installed, the extension dropped a background script designed to check for OAuth token keys in Chrome storage, which would then get automatically synced to the Google user's Google Cloud storage. Uh, to get access to the synced sensitive data, the threat actor would only have to log into the same Google account on another system running the Chrome browser uh, since third-party Chromium-based browsers are not allowed to use the Chrome, the private Google Chrome Sync API. All right. This would allow them to communicate with the Chrome browser in the victim's network by abusing Google's infrastructure, he revealed. This is probably the link to his article. Let's look at that in a second as well. Uh, let's see, about five minutes left. While there are some limitations on the size of data and amount of requests, it's actually perfect for a CNC, aka command and control commands, um, which are generally small for stealing small but sensitive data, such as auth tokens. Uh, the keys to the kingdom. So the threat actor focused the attack on manipulating the data web app data and didn't attempt to extend their malicious activity to the underlying system. The reasoning for this behavior is quite simple. They also wanted to extend their access. They actually limited activities on the workstation to those related to web apps which explains why they dropped only the malicious Chrome extension and not any other binaries. Uh, that being said, it also makes sense. Almost everything is managed through a web app these days. It's true, this is the new frontier. Uh, we need to manage Chrome extensions and browsers uh, very much more closely than we have been. And there's tons of policy that can be set on Chrome. Uh, so if you're not doing that now and you're working in InfoSec or you're joining a company in the future, uh, definitely work on a, a browser uh, security uh, uh, focus. Anyway, blocking the malicious extension from exfiltrating data would require also blocking servers used by Google. Now, if you're thinking, you know, we don't want to just block servers, right? Um, you know, to block attackers using Chrome, Google Chrome's Sync API for harvesting and exfiltrating data, he recommends group policies to create a list of approved Chrome extensions and block all others that have to be checked for red flags. Uh, and then this one looks like the story. This looks like the one written by the actual poster of this story that we're following. Um, anyway, so this is a good story to go check out um, and dive into further. Let's see if I can find uh, one more before closing up uh, tonight's lecture. Uh, let's see, Google Chrome, Microsoft IE, zero days in the crosshairs. Google late Thursday shipped an emergency patch, which we just checked for earlier. Security research push for bug bounty program of last resort, not identity and access management. FBI El Paso warns about not posting your CDC COVID vaccination card on social media platforms. I guess that's identity, right? Um, your cards, I guess people are copying them uh, in order to travel uh, using those. Um, possible victims in sextortion investigation um, not uh, today's topic. Um, former Nike marketing manager charged in scheme to defraud company. Um, this looks interesting. This could be identity and access. We'll see. Open link. Errol. Uh, what was the name? Errol Amarin Andom of Beaverton. Former Nike marketing manager charged to scheme and defraud a company. Uh, attorney Billy Williams announced today that a uh, 49-year-old former marketing manager at Nike has been charged with criminal information with wire fraud, money laundering, and making false statements on a loan application as part of a scheme to defraud his former employer. Um, I know the head of threat intelligence at Mike, Nike. I think she's a rock star. I wonder if she was related to this investigation. Because uh, this is essentially an insider threat story, right? Um, and uh, even if it wasn't a current employer. Uh, according to the information from 2001 until his termination in 2018, 
And then was employed by Nike at the headquarters in Beaverton. Most recently, he worked as a manager in the company's North America retail marketing division, where he managed the design, build out, and optimization of pop up retail stores. Uh, in the summer of 2016, he recruited a childhood friend to establish a company to design and build the pop ups. Oh, okay, so he probably just sent money to his friend's company because he had control and access, right? Uh, as a manager to ensure the friend's company was consistently awarded the contracts, though he had no formal role. Adam assumed control of much of the company's financial operations, managing financial accounts and issuing invoices to Nike. To conceal his role in the scheme, Adam used an alter ego, Frank Little, to invoice Nike and manage the contract the company's account with Square. Um, you know, those little swipe things for reading credit cards. Interesting. So this is definitely an uh, identity and access management story. Uh, let's see, in 2016, he also renewed and lapsed registration of an Oregon-based limited liability corporation he owned so that he could use the defunct entity as a shell company to funnel the proceeds diverted from Nike and his friend's company to accounts under his personal control. Uh, so that's what crime and theft looks like, right? And let's see. Um, the financial statement falsely reflected his revenue checks for $194,000 drawn on a bank account owned by his friend's business, forged his friend's signature on the check, and withdrew much of that money without his friend's knowledge. I guess they're not friends anymore. Uh, Adam faces a maximum sentence of 30 years in prison, fines of up to $4.5 million, and five years supervised release. He'll be arraigned on March 5th, 2021, before a U.S. magistrate judge. Um, so how would InfoSec um, play into this? Um, well, obviously, uh, vendor procurement and supply chain management, you need to do good research, right, on these companies that are invoicing. And you need to understand the security of those companies uh, and the behaviors of those users. Um, how you would know Frank Little was uh, an alter ego to sign invoices, I'm not sure. I mean, you'd have to do background checks, I guess, on anyone that uh, is an entity that's doing business with you um, and who signs checks and invoices. And how else could you have tracked down this internal user? Um, I guess um, some type of anomaly detection as to who gets awarded the contracts, right? Um, he was consistently awarding the contracts, you know, to his friend's uh, linked company. And you might not have known, and you know, unless you were doing an investigation, uh, that it was a linked company. But you can certainly potentially, you know, notice that um, if uh, one company is awarded a disproportionate number of contracts, right? You could analyze that and do some heuristics. Um, but I think that's it for today. We've reached uh, six o'clock. Um, I wish I had given myself a glass of water to work with tonight. Um, but uh, anyway, that was week two, identity and access management, people process tools, introduction to salaries and compensation and different philosophy of uh, brand awareness. Uh, we'll see you next week. And until then, um, email me or check me out in the Slack channel. Uh, if you have questions about getting your, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, student proposals for your projects together. I'm still working with the CISO and the InfoSec at NYU to get some approved. I don't have any yet, but that's okay. We'll, we'll have to extend uh, the draft proposals for another week uh, to make sure uh, that you can get them into me. So I know the syllabus and the um, proposal said end of week two, which is now, um, but we'll extend that one more week uh, to try to get traction on which uh, projects you'll be working on. And then I'll, I'll send out an announcement to everyone with that same info. Uh, so good night and um, talk to you or you know talk at you again next week. Cheers. <laughs>